Hello everyone. Welcome to part two revision of uh, our CMA final law marathon in complete English. Now part one has already been uploaded on YouTube channel and complete marathon in English that is a mix of Hindi and English is also uploaded on the YouTube channel. Hope you're enjoying the same. This is crisp, effective, concise and absolutely exam oriented quick revision to aid you in your preparation. Make the most of it and um, of course your love can be shared in the form of likes and beautiful comments. That's all that I need or any teacher needs from you all. So enjoy learning. This is complete, complete, complete marathon and it's going to revise, help you revise the complete subject. So all the chapters are being covered half over here and half in part one. Right. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the marathon. Okay, let's now revise the chapter of corporate governance. Now we all know that in our syllabus there are two chapters and collectively we call it corporate governance only. One is corporate governance and the second one is social, economic and environmental responsibilities, right? So both the chapters we have to study and then our complete coverage of corporate governance that carries 15 marks weightage that will be covered, right? Of course, this is a revision class, so we are not going to discuss everything in detail. We are not going to waste our time on any unimportant aspect, on any um, n number of examples, I can say, because corporate governance, we all know, is a very wide topic, right? In fact, if we go out to study every single aspect, then I think it can be a subject in its whole, right? So we cannot read everything we cannot right now. Of course, we have done a lot of examples in the regular class, but this is not possible again here because it will only result in waste of time of yours more importantly than mine, right? So here we will restrict to our exam oriented revision. What type of questions are asked in examination? What are the areas? What are the things that we need to learn from examination perspective so that we can fetch good marks from it? Right, that is our intention and with that intention we are going to revise this chapter. First thing is, what do you mean by corporate governance? Simple, if we put it in simple words, it is ways how corporates are being governed. Now, I am saying corporates, I am not saying company. Corporate is a wider term. Every company is a body corporate. Every body corporate may not be a company. We all know that. So we are talking about the wider term that is corporate. Now, how they are being governed, that means how they are being directed, how they are being controlled, what are the rules, what are the processes, what are the laws that they have to follow. Ma'am, all the laws, all the rules, we read in n number of acts. Like Companies Act, if I talk about company, how it will be governed, it is given in Companies Act. So why corporate governance? Well, to be more specific, corporate governance is also those set of policies, those set of policies which are created for good governance. of corporate now comes the important punch in terms of in terms of accountability transparency and ethical practices this is the main punch over here which is all about corporate governance 
So we know that we have a lot of laws which tells us how a corporate should run, what a company should do, how a company should raise capital, raise funds, how a company uh, should issue loans, how a company should appoint its directors. A lot of things are being given, right? But they are laws. Now laws, or rather if I begin with some ethics, ethics are what? Ethics are kind of morals, although we know the difference between morals and ethics also. Ethical practices, that means the practices which are um, good. What are good practices, ma'am? If I am a company, if I am not hiring my employees just like that, if I have provided a good environment for my employees, if I have provided them adequate services, if I'm not treating my consumers, if I am faithful towards my stakeholders, if I include all my stakeholders in the decision making, all this is what? Good practices, right? Or I would say they might not turn out to be very good or very profitable, but then they are ethical, right? Ethical is the choice between good and bad or you can say right and wrong sometimes wrong and wrong right so we are not going into deep into ethics that is not our topic our topic is corporate governance so ethics is a choice and ethics differ from person to person that is why it is important that ethical practices be imbibed as mandatory in our laws because if it is left to choices some industries like tata who have been known for corporate governance will undoubtedly go on and run their companies in a manner that they care for everyone who is connected to them, be it environment, be their employees, be the government, right? However, some mean business houses could turn out to be really brutal and um, they can actually not think about ethical practices and only focus on maximizing the profit, which will not be good for their own self, but they may do that which will not be good for the society as well. So it is important that some rules and some practices which are ethical, which promotes accountability, which promotes transparency, that is being made mandatory. So initially, it was not mandatory. Then it became suggestive that people should do that to build their better reputation, to enhance uh, uh, their profitability, everything. So it was suggestive. And later on, it became mandatory. So right now, we have a lot of laws through these legal framework. Legal framework includes Companies Act 2013, the SEBI guidelines, Kumar Mangalam Billa report, the accountant standards, which are issued by uh, ICAI, the listing agreements, in all those laws which are prevalent, which the corporates have to abide by, they also contain some rules on the tenets of or the facets of accountability, transparency and ethical practices, right? So they have some rules that, some rules with respect to this also. So when I talk, what is corporate governance? It is nothing but set of some rules or set of some policies which govern how a company should run to ensure good governance, right? What is good governance? Good governance means if you're running, uh, keeping in mind accountability, transparency. In fact, we have three broad pillars of corporate governance, which is fairness, accountability, and transparency. Fact, right? These are the three pillars. So if we work on that, if we have made laws, if we have made rules, if we have made policies to ensure good governance, that means to ensure that these principles are there in our company, that set of policies are corporate governance. Why do you think corporate governance is needed? Undoubtedly, it improves or it helps to build a great brand image. So undoubtedly, the first thing that you can say is that it increases the brand reputation. You would undoubtedly, if I talk about employees, if there is a company in which employees are being treated very badly, and there is a company which gives a lot of importance to its human resources and employees, well, as an employee, I would definitely want to join that company. So I will be loyal towards that company. So that company is being benefited by 
serving its employees or by doing something from for its employees so it is not the benefit of only society if a corporate is doing good governance practices or is running a company in such a manner that it's ensuring accountability transparency and ethical practices fairness everything in the company then it is not just the company which is uh, not just the stakeholders or the society which is being benefited it is more importantly the company which is being benefited because the customers will be loyal the employees will be loyal right um government will also take care everyone will be loyal so it will help to have that enhanced uh, brand reputation help to raise the funds also very easily because people will be uh, investors will have a faith bank will have a faith so they will also give you loans so you will have a better financial stability you will have a healthy economic growth so there are a lot of benefits of corporate governance fine ma'am now i told you three pillars fairness fairness is all about ethical practices also accountability and transparency fairness that means you are treating everyone all your stakeholders not just your shareholders but all your stakeholders fairly accountability that means um, there is someone who is taking responsibility for whatever actions are being taken by the company transparency is all about disclosures if i have adequate information about the company why is it doing this why is it doing that then i'll have a better faith if i don't know why this person is doing that so transparency is about informing is about disclosing things to stakeholders so we must ensure disclosures now all these principles have been somehow now ensured over the period of time through various legal framework right fine ma'am how firstly companies act if i talk about companies act the first thing is a lot of uh, participation right i'm writing over here or let me go to the other page and write so when i talk about legal framework just a second when i talk about legal framework what is it companies act sebi loader regulations which we have read separately so we don't need to revise this again because we have a chap separate chapter sebi loader right then we also have kumar mangalam bella report we have as by icai we also have uh, other listing agreements and all and other acts right so we are not concerned about this right now we are concerned about this first of all when i talk about companies act companies act what happens ma'am participation of shareholders we all know that under companies act we have two decision making authorities one is board of directors the other is shareholders now although board of directors are the ones or um, if i come back over here i can clearly say that promoters form the company right they may become shareholder they may not become shareholder they ideally ultimately when a company is formed there are some people who are first directors of the company they named as first directors and then there are some first auditors of the company and there after the election process goes on right the members elect the board of directors as well as the auditors now the board of directors manage the company they are in people of charge they are the ones who are actually responsible for corporate governance because they direct and control the company how do they control the company by following which principles and policies are they are these policies uh, actually justifying fairness accountability and transparency if yes then that is corporate governance 
good corporate governance or good governance right so this is all the relevant set of policies which direct a company to promote fact the principles of corporate governance right so we know that ultimately board of directors are responsible but but a lot of places some powers are being reserved by companies act for the shareholders that no no board if you want to borrow so much amount of money no 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 wait ask the shareholders you want to enter into a transaction with your own director oh my god there may be some fraud involved wait 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 ask the shareholders so we are through companies act involving our shareholders we are uh, encouraging our shareholders to participate in the decision making through or and sr right so sometimes the simple majority is needed sometimes special majority is needed we also have something called as operation and mismanagement so we have a separate chapter where in you protect the interest of minority shareholders so it's not just that the majority shareholders have been given importance also the minority shareholders have been given importance many shareholders cannot participate in the voting process because they cannot attend the voting attend the meetings that's why remote e voting process has been introduced right so this has been encouraged through companies act when i talk about the next part sebi loader regulation we have absolutely separate um chapter for the same if i talk about kumar mangalam birla report then i can say all the recommendations major recommendations of this report have now been embodied in the regulations however what were the major things more than equal to 50% or your board of directors should be comprised of more than equal to 50% of non executive directors right so this was one of the major breakthrough then the directors should not be a member of more than 10 committees 10 committees less than equal to 10 committees and less than equal to 10 committees uh, chairman less than equal to chairman of five committees member of 10 committees right so these are some major breakthroughs of this kumar mangalam birla report then we have accounting standards issued by icai then we also have agreement listing agreement whenever any company becomes listed it has to enter into an agreement with the stock exchange which contains a lot of clauses okay fine ma'am so we have this legal framework also now when when do you think this corporate governance came into picture we had a phase called as before liberalization and after liberalization before liberalization there weren't a lot of companies who were raising funds from public see when public funds or public invest then government gets concerned that the hard earned money of general public at large should be carefully handled right it should not happen that some companies come they raise funds they cheat the company uh, they cheat public and then they run away so when liberalization took place that means the economy was opened uh, for the global level then a lot of companies raised funds and a lot of public were involved in all of that then government made new strict rules that there should be adequate disclosure there should be ethical practices we should promote fairness we should do all that right so mainly after liberalization this corporate governance came into picture however even after liberalization that is you can say undoubtedly in 1991 we had liberalization even after that we had oops we had two phases see pre liberalization not much of the things happened after liberalization after liberalization we had two phases 
after liberalization first phase or you can say this is also known as before satyam and then we have second phase which is also known as after satyam so before satyam it was from year 1996 to 2008 and after satyam it was after 2008 here we basically have the mca and cb they both took some real actions recommendations guidelines national voluntary guidelines we read about that right and here before satyam before satyam we have a huge list See, this is the huge list. Okay, now, ma'am, what type of questions are being asked in examination? See, till now you can say you are sometimes asked about the legal framework of corporate governance. Now, what is the legal framework? I explained to you about this legal framework. So, this is the legal framework. If a question is asked in examination, you have to write two, four lines each, right, for every point. where there are more content you can write more content where there is less content you can like write less content but this is a type of short question which is asked then you are also asked the evolution of corporate governance that is how the corporate governance evolved in india so you can undoubtedly say that pre liberalization there was nothing major for corporate governance post liberalization has been divided into two phases first phase and the second phase right the first phase has a lot of points which have been summarized here and the second phase has lesser points basically there are sebi actions and mc actions right so that is how the uh, corporate governance has evolved over the period of time then there can be short notes also although uh, the short notes like uh, this cii hardly it is asked hardly you have to remember the year because when we talk about objective questions then definitely these objective questions this points are being asked okay so in objective questions this points may be asked but otherwise specifically these are not asked because they are anyways history again a question like history of corporate governance it is nothing but evolution only so it is just the language that has been changed so that type of question can also be asked in examination so we have to be uh, fine, careful about it fine okay fine ma'am So now we read about the first phase of corporate governance. Nineteen ninety-eight Confederation of Indian Industry, that is CII, which gave the first ever desirable code of corporate governance. Right? It first because we all know that okay, fine. These are the ethical practices that I have to do, or i have to be more ethical i have to be more transparent i have to disclose but then what do i disclose how do i be more ethical there should be some policy some set of rules that okay fine whenever you raise funds you disclose these things whenever you do this you have to do this whenever you do this inform this pre hand right make this for um, employees make this for so what are the policies what are the rules so cii it is an autonomous uh, body right this first came up with the rules of corporate governance of course they were not mandatorily applicable on all the companies it was the objective was just to uh, provide such a set of rules which can be followed by the corporates okay so it had uh, a lot of uh, points which were included private sector public sector banks financial institutions everyone now next is our 1999 kumar mangalam birla report now kumar mangalam birla report what is it there was a committee which was formed and it was led by birla sir right because he was a very great industrialist and uh, he was doing really well so his vision could bring a lot of policies in the form of laws 
applicable or helpful for the entire nation. So he was appointed as a chairman and a committee was formed. And this committee's motive was uh, to make some laws on insider trading, then uh, some disclosures. And accordingly, Kumar Bing Mangalam Birla Committee came up with a beautiful report and a lot of recommendations that this should be disclosed and all that, which is which was later on imbibed. See, if I talk about the present situation, this is history, my dear. We are reading history. This has already become law. Most of it has already become law. Okay, so now we have those set of ethical practices imbibed in our law, which is mandatory for everyone to follow. But at that particular point of time, it was not there. So these were recommended. Fine. Okay, ma'am. Then we had an MCA task force, which was also there to um, come up through some um, suggestions. Then we also had in 2000, in year 2000, clause 49th of listing agreement. Okay, so there, this is a popular clause, we all know that. Um, they were firstly applied to the large companies and not the smaller companies. In clause 49, a lot of importance was given to the independence of boards and the committees and a lot of disclosures. So we had that every company which becomes a listing company, there should be a clause 49 which must be inserted. And clause 49, by inserting clause 49, the uh, respective listed company must comply with these things. Fine, ma'am. So we had an enactment of clause 49. Okay. In 2001, in 2001, we had our RBI advisory group or report on corporate governance. Now, there are two reports on corporate governance and also on the directors. This is mainly about, because RBI is involved, this is mainly about our banks and financial institutions. Okay. See, everyone is different. All the countries are different. All the banks which are working in the country, they are all different. So they might have their own different, different policies. When I talk about the global level, right, uh, there are some international set of principles which were, which were released by OECD. What is OECD? Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So this is an international body. Like we have a lot of international bodies. We become member of those bodies. The different countries become member of those bodies. And we follow the recommendations. We follow the principles that are being released by them in our own nation as well. So likewise, this is an organization which released a set of Principles on corporate governance. Now, these became international benchmarks. And we had to follow these international benchmarks to improve our financial sector as well. Okay. Fine. So, they all developed some principles and we had to follow that principles. And um, we also had to follow the best international practices by Basel Committee. We know that in banking sector, we have the basal norms, basal one, two, three recommendations. So we follow that. What are they? They suggest the best international banking practices. If our banks also follow that, we can grow. Right. So the same were being suggested. Then in the year 2002, we had Naresh Chandra Committee. Again, report on uh, corporate audit and uh, the governance committee and all that. So it has mainly to do with the auditors and the certification. In 2003, we had Narayan Murthy committee, mainly about directors, related party and um, risk management. Then we have Naresh Chandra committee 2, report on regulation of companies as well as um, partnerships. Now, See, earlier also we had law, Companies Act 1956. 
But we all know that these laws became redundant or obsolete. That is why a need was felt to change the law. We know that Companies Act 2013 came into picture and before that there was Companies Act 1956. Why the whole act had to be repealed? We could bring in some amendments. But those amendments were not very helpful because the whole situation, the whole scenario, the whole need of law had changed. So we had to actually repeal the old law. So the same was being um, suggested. And in fact, a shift or a change in Partnership Act was also suggested, although we do not have corporate governance imbibed in partnerships till date. We have this imbibed in companies, but not in partnerships. So some things have taken shape, some things have not taken shape. Okay. Then comes our OECD principles, because I did not discuss the OECD principles earlier. Let me discuss them with you now. We broadly have six principles and again an examination question. OECD principles are asked straightforward directly in your examination and you must learn all these six principles. What are these ma'am? The first thing, effective, the basis, basis for an effective corporate governance framework. So whatever corporate governance uh, policies you are bringing in, they should be effective. It's not just that for the sake of policies you're bringing in and making any policy. No, you should see that uh, they should be consistent with the law. They should not hinder the law because if they hinder the law, what will we people follow the law or your policies, right? So it should be consistent with the law and uh, it should be effective. Right, that is the main motive. Then comes your rights of shareholders. The shareholders should be encouraged more participation. They should have better uh, rights. Right, and um, the key is effective shareholder participation in the key corporate decisions. Next is disclosure and transparency. So whatever principles you make, it should ensure that there is timely and accurate disclosure on all the important matters which are needed. Then comes your responsibility of board. Whatever principles or whatever framework you're making, it should ensure that uh, the board takes its responsibility. The board is accountable to the company as well as to the shareholders. It monitors everything. Then comes your equitable treatment. Uh, of shareholders see a lot of times a lot of importance is being given to the majority shareholders oh my god he has 60 percent shares in the company he is given due importance but no the framework or the principle should be in such a manner that even the minority shareholders have been given equitable treatment right and then role of stakeholders we should involve we should encourage that uh, stakeholders all the stakeholders cooperate Okay, so these were about OECD principles. Now we come to the second phase. So these are all the first phase and you have to learn it. Okay, because it is asked an examination. You have to learn separately OECD principles as well. Now we come to the second phase. MC actions and SEBI actions. MC actions we discuss later because we have the voluntary guidelines to be discussed later. And SEBI actions... What were the SEBI actions? What SEBI actions uh, took? Rotation of auditors. Now we have it. Rotation of auditors. Right. Then um, IFRS. Then some disclosures. Streamlining of a streamline of uh, timelines. Different, different timelines etc. Okay, so these were some SEBI actions. Clear? Fine, ma'am. Now, what next? The next topic that we have in this chapter is corporate governance practices or it is also called as corporate governance codes in India. This is also 
a question which is asked in examination, right? It is ideally divided into, I would say, five categories. What five categories, ma'am? Corporation and society. Then absentee shareholder privacy and protection. Then board and processes disclosure and unlisted company, corporate governance. Corporate governance practices in India, or you can say Companies Act 2013, key initiatives. Till now, we were reading about the recommendations or the policies now. What are the practices which have been included in Companies Act 2013? So the corporate governance practices which exist for the society, for the absentee shareholder, for the board, for the purpose of transparency, that is disclosure, and for unlisted companies. So the whole topic has been divided into five categories. Fine, ma'am. Companies Act initiate corporate governance practices in India. For society, we have CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, section number 135, which is an absolute delightful topic we have in uh, Companies Act 2013, section 135, read in the chapter of Accounts and Audit. Right, accounts of companies ideally, but in our syllabus, the chapter is named as accounts and audit. Right, we also have some other things uh, like um, directors to work um, in interest for everyone. That is, the duties of directors have been specified in section 166. So they have to work for the society, they have to work for everyone. Right. We also have uh, the relationship committee, stakeholders relationship committee, which has to be formed for the society. So we have different, different laws for that. Coming to absentee shareholder primacy and protection. Who are we talking about? Absentee shareholder. The shareholders who do not hold a lot of importance. The shareholders who refrain themselves from taking active part in the decision making. Why? Because they maybe they don't have the adequate knowledge, maybe they do not have the time. So time, lack of time, lack of resources, lack of energy, lack of knowledge, all this can result in absentee shareholder. How do we protect the interest of these absentee shareholders? Because the majority shareholders will take um, on and uh, they will take every decision in their benefit. They will ignore the minority sector. So for that, we have, um, undoubtedly, we have something called as protection of minority shareholders. We also have something called as restraint on voting rights of interested members. So whenever you are entering into a, any transaction with a related party, you have to ensure that only, only non-interested members vote. And you have to take the um, consent of shareholders. So only non-interested members vote. Right. Then there are some restrictions which have been imposed on the directors. Also, we have something which uh, is like limiting the subsidiaries beyond two layers. Not subsidiaries of investment companies, but subsidiaries of all companies. Right. So that the money, if I have collected, the company has collected money from the shareholder and now the money is being uh, shifted from here to there to there to there. No, beyond two years, it is not allowed. So somehow they are also being protected. Now, a short note question can also be asked on this topic, absentee shareholder primacy and protection. So you have to write this. If you don't know how to write it, I would really insist that you read the material 
any material from which you're studying, be it the study material, be it the material provided by your uh, respective mentor or whatever. So you read the material and try to write it because writing here is very important. Because you know the topic, you might not be able to present it well. So writing is very important. Fine. Then board and your processes. For board, we have ample of rules. Boards, there has to be strict composition. Independent directors are included, women director is included, resident director is included, right? There is a code for independent director, how you have to behave. Then um, a nominee directors are there. There is a nomination and remuneration committee which suggests that who should be, who is deserving and who should be there. Um, <clears throat> not just independent directors are included, their independence is made, uh, their independence counts. A lot of decisions are such that even if you call a board meeting and an independent director is not present, then that resolution will not be passed unless it is circulated and at least one independent director approves it. So we have some um, situations like that also. So independence is given due importance. A director should not be overburdened and he should effectively contribute to the company. That's why there has been a limit on the maximum number of directorships that he may hold. Right. Okay. Fine. So for what term he will be appointed and uh, what will be the cool off period, then even the committees will have half independent directors. Whatever they are being paid, it will be um, disclosed in the remuneration policy. They cannot be paid. Independent directors cannot be paid lower, right? Women director cannot be paid lower. So we have different, different laws for them also. Then comes your disclosure and transparency in reporting. Again, we have three things, financials, auditors, and operation and mismanagement. Disclosure and transparency in the reporting part. So first thing is financials. The financials have to be according to Schedule 3. There have to be CFS, that is Consolidated Financial uh, Statements. They have to be audited undoubtedly and we also have created an authority called as NFRA, National Financial Reporting Authority. So this authority is going to supervise and oversee the quality of professionals whether the audit have been conducted in the manner or not, whether they're following the standards or not. So we have a superseding authority also. Um, then can the financial statements be restated or reproduced? Yes, but that is subject to only section 130 and 131. So you can revise the financial statement or the boats report. You can also, uh, you also might have to recast your accounts if, it is being directed by NCLT. See, if you do not remember the provisions, it will be very difficult to catch up with the pace. And then you will be like, what is ma'am saying? So undoubtedly, this is revision and pure revision. If you have read the subject, if you know the concepts, then you will enjoy this revision to the core, trust me. Because the super effective revision, you won't find uh, anywhere else, right? A lot of time, the things are being deviated. This is absolute effective revision for your examination perspective. If you go with the flow, if you can catch up with the pace, then trust me, you are definitely going to succeed in examination. Okay, so work on that. Then um, undoubtedly, we also have something called as section number 134, which talks about the board's report. So board has been uh, instructed, the board of directors have been instructed to disclose a lot of matters. Then comes your auditors audit and auditors. So auditors, we have a fixed tenure of appointment. We have their rotation. We have their cool off period. How the auditor will be removed. That is also being there. NCLT also have the power to remove the auditor in case there is fraud. 
then uh, auditor has to be independent we have the disqualification of auditors not everyone can become the auditor we also have section number 144 which says that auditor cannot render certain type of services they also have to follow the audit standards right then we have um, O and M, that is prevention of oppression and mismanagement. Although we have an entire chapter for the same. So we don't need to discuss this again over here. But this is all about protection of minority shareholders. Right. So in this, we have a lot of provisions for different, different sectors. A question may be asked for you about prevention of oppression and mismanagement also, but that you don't have to write from here, that you can straight away go to the chapter and you can compile it and then you can write it. Okay, fine ma'am. Okay, now, unlisted companies governance, that also I told you. Uh, now, for unlisted companies, we do not have a lot of uh, rules which have been framed or which have been made strict but yes there are certain situations for even private companies for even unlisted public companies also there are some things which have to be followed right so can it be extended yes undoubtedly it can be extended you just have to read there is a sh short paragraph which has been given and you must read that now we move to the next part what is the next part ma'am Corporate governance in family business and MOU. When I say about family business in family business, it has certain advantages, certain disadvantages, certain issues, the corporate governance and governance issues. So we read this topic divided into five topics. What does family business, family business like Reliance, where the next generation is taking over the business. Now, undoubtedly, uh, there are many family businesses, some tend to be at a very small scale and some undoubtedly grow uh, very big also, right? So they are started by some few family members and they take the form of large business houses so that is also something which is very uh, prominent that we see in our nation it has nothing to do whether the business is small or the big or big right if i talk about some well-known group there are a lot of well-known groups we don't need to really discuss about them advantages a question can be asked what are the advantages of family business right so advantages of family business over non-family business, the first one, quick decision making. In non-family business, you don't know where the person comes from, whether I can call him at night or not. Maybe he's available, he's not available. In family business, you can discuss over a dinner table as well, right? And when you can discuss things, you can take quick decisions, right? So agile decision making, there is a lot of passion because it is family business. You're working for your own family. So maybe you are a lot more passionate to um, enhance the business. There is a lot of experience which is involved. See, a lot of learnings you get from your father, from your grandfather, right? So they know and they have for the generations, they have seen how the things have turned, they have developed a relation. So that helps you a lot because they have good insight. And more importantly, you trust each other. I mean, maybe uh, trust is also shaken in families. But at the same time, if you have to trust with some money, you know that it's going to be fine. You have to. That is the advantage. At the same time, it can be disadvantage for you also if that is not the family. Now, disadvantage comes. Who is going to take the throne? There are four sons who should become the CEO. That comes the problem, right? So family conflicts can be the major problem. And since you are all involved in the family only, there is no external person who is there, then maybe raising funds can also be the problem. You cannot reach to a consensus that who should be given what authority. Some people um, who are exceptionally talented, they do not want to join the family business. 
right supposedly some child gets into the iit and iims now he doesn't want to come back to the family business he has his own aspirations and dreams and if such good talent is not coming into the business then that is also a loss right so maybe and even the family uh, or you can say the people in the family they're going out and the external people are reluctant to join the firm why are they reluctant because maybe this is all a family undoubtedly they will promote their own family members so even if i perform exceptionally well i might not be ever able to get that uh, highest position in the company so they are also reluctant that why i don't want to get into a family affair right so it is difficult to hire good people right so these are the challenges also that uh, family businesses face they have several issues uh, internal disputes and all that and uh, sometimes the professional and personal lives get mixed so it is difficult to streamline both the things right there might be generation gap and generation issues as well the younger generation if they join the business they might have different views which the older generation does not approve right so they have certain issues and um, undoubtedly there should be corporate governance in family businesses as well how there can be ethical practices or set of policies be imbibed in the family business so that they grow well um see if there are ethical practices it will improve the competitiveness otherwise what will happen one generation has worked really hard and they have tried to conquer a lot of market but the next generation comes and everything gets spoiled but if you assign the roles and responsibilities properly to everyone if you have seen the movie bahubali there are there were two prospective candidates who could get the throne right now ideally the successor was someone else but then they both were put to test and whoever qualified the test got the throne so this is the ideal policy which should be taken even in family business rather than just passing on the legacy okay then that he is my son so undoubtedly he will become the ceo no all the people who are there you should check whoever is deserving you should probably make them set of policies and criteria okay so you should encourage that they join you should maintain such a harmonized environment that even the external people don't feel reluctant to join the firm so all this part of policy should be imbibed in the family business right okay fine ma'am then we have something called as mou what is mou ma'am memorandum of understanding where memorandum of understanding comes into picture in state owned businesses state owned businesses means what the government is involved so government enters into a memorandum of understanding with the public sector enterprise yes or no yes ma'am now when i say this um you can say this mou is nothing but a document and it contains the obligations or the responsibilities that fine who is going to do what or who what is going to be managed by what who has to report what what has to be done so all the details are being boiled down into an agreement and they are being recorded which is known as memorandum of understanding right fine ma'am now whenever this has to take place there are three um institutional arrangement you can say which are involved which is hpc tf and dpe rather i would say mou division has high power committee task force and mou division okay so these are the three institutional arrangements which are involved in this mou system high power committee is the apex it has the cabinet secretary as the chairman finance secretary as the member um, then uh, expenditure secretary planning commission a lot of people are involved what do they do 
the review i think i have incorporated it over here anyways they review the draft before it is signed they review the draft okay now the power to approve the final mou it has been delegated to the task force and um, only when task force is unable to do that work it is being directed to hpc now what happens i will tell you a draft is being prepared by the public sector enterprise it is being submitted to this department dpe is what department of public enterprises wherein we have a mou division okay so it is being submitted to the department and thereafter it is being examined by the task force if task force is unable to process it then it passes the same to high power committee and then they see it they finalize it they approve it if there is any query you can get the clarification you can negotiate meeting and thereafter the mou is finalized which is also reviewed and given score at the end of each year that how much you have been able to meet the commitments and give the progress right so this is how it is being signed so we have hpc we have task force and mou division actually assist both of them so it supports the task force also and it assists the hpc also okay fine a question sometimes is asked on high power committee write a short note on high power committee write a short note on mou division right so what are the benefits of mou system so uh, these are the type of short notes which may be asked in your examination moving to our next chapter that is social environmental and economic responsibilities before i start this chapter you all must know about triple bottom line what is it ma'am people planet and profit any business organization should work for people planet and profit that means it should be responsible it should have a social responsibility that means towards people it should have environmental responsibility that is towards planet and it should have economic responsibility of profit making so it should try to maximize the profit it should reduce the waste it should be fair to public right people this is all this chapter's name is all about social economic and environmental responsibility now the first thing we talk in this chapter is uh, or what things we have to talk in this chapter we have nvg which is a question as as asked in examination we have something called as csr we have something called as e governance and we have something called as xbrl so xbrl we read in the chapter of accounts of companies we are not discussing over here right now e governance csr and nvg csr also we read ideally in the chapter of companies act um, in the chapter of accounts under companies act section number 135 nvg as i told you second phase of reforms mca actions so mca recommended national voluntary guidelines national voluntary guidelines 2011 on social environmental and economic responsibilities we have nine principles and this is again an examiner's favorite question so you must you must remember this okay so ideally uh, i have made this short form also and i have tried to explain make you learn this in class as well so you can follow this if it works for you anyways i am discussing the nine policies i'm just reviewing the nine policies here with you first thing ethics transparency and accountability so whatever business you do whatever um, processes you enter into you should ensure that it is ethical at all levels you must provide adequate disclosures you must be responsible for whatever actions you must make someone responsible for the actions 
second comes uh, about sustainability safe and sustainable so whatever goods and services let me take over here I'm taking you to the main book. Okay, so principle number two. You should provide goods and services in the manner which is safe and sustainable. Whatever products you're producing, plastics are being banned, right? So whatever products you're producing, you should ensure that you make optimal use <laughs> of all the resources. You avoid the waste and you provide them in a sustainable manner. If there are hazardous goods that you're producing, you must ensure its safety. You must provide the safety instructions and everything. Next is you must promote the well-being of all your employees. So whoever is employed in your business organization, you must ensure that you uh, take their participation. You ensure their work-life balance. You're not making them just work, work and work. There should be a good workplace which is being created there shouldn't be any harassment there should be safe hygienic right proper washrooms should be there everything there should be fair wages the fair wages should be provided timely so all that should be ensured next principle you should respect the interest of all the stakeholders okay uh, so you should identify first of all your stakeholders who are the stakeholders and you should disclose them everything you should be transparent that whatever uh, um, important matters are there they should be communicated to them if they have any concerns or grievances there should be an adequate platform that they can come to you and you should try to resolve the differences you should protect and respect human rights. See, when we read about our Indian constitution, Indian constitution grants and confers fundamental rights, human rights, right? So constitution grants the rights to us. Who are you to take that rights from us? So when constitution itself has given the rights, we should also respect the human rights and everyone should have access to that basic rights, the right to life and all that, right? Businesses should respect and restore the environment. So recycle, reuse, manage resources optimally, right? Energy efficient and all that. Then businesses, when engaged in influencing public, they should be responsible. A lot of times the big business houses are also a part of policy making. If I talk about the telecom sector, maybe a new policy has to be made in the telecom sector. The ones who are the big telecom players, they are involved in this decision making. Like if I talk about the institute, maybe institute has to bring up some policy. It will actually include a lot of people. So whoever is included in the policy making, they should be responsible. They should not think for their own benefit. Okay. Then they should promote inclusive growth and equitable development. A very general point that uh, you should not uh, just grow, grow and grow. There should be an equitable development. That means um, you should understand the negative impacts also. That if you are maximizing the profit, what is the cost that the nation has to bear or the society has to bear or the environment has to bear? Right. So your growth should be inclusive that I grow, everyone grows. So somehow you should be sensitive to all the local concerns as well. Then businesses should engage and provide value to their consumers in a responsible manner. Consumer is the king. So ultimately you're working for the consumer. So consumers should have the choice, should have um, the products which are being competitively priced, right? Lesser negative impacts of the usage of goods. They should be aware about the safety hazards and uh, the usage, everything, the ingredients. We see that even on every packet, the ingredients and everything is mentioned. Why? Because that is something which is needed. Okay, so these are the nine principles. And uh, then comes your CSR. Corporate social responsibility. So here we are talking about the 
corporates that they have to be socially responsible. Now, whatever corporates are earning from the society, if I'm making a profit of five crores, I am earning it from the society. So I must also contribute something towards the society, right? If it is left as a voluntary choice, no one would really come up. But if it is made mandatory, then the people have to do it. They do not have a choice. So it has been made mandatory. We know that we have a section, section 135, which makes it mandatory that 2% of net profit, average net profit of past three years, that is the minimum expenditure on CSR, on CSR, which must be done by every company which comes into the or which crosses the threshold on which CSR becomes applicable. So we have section 135, which tells that on these companies, if your net profit is beyond this, so if you fall into that criteria, that means CSR becomes applicable. And if CSR becomes applicable, minimum 2% of net profit you have to spend towards welfare of society. What is going to be treated as welfare of society? We have schedule and in that schedule, it is clearly given. So we have the schedule wherein the points are given that if you work towards any of these, they will be treated as CSR activity, right? Ideally, CSR is something which is a philanthropic activity. It is there in our roots, right? If you ask our grandfathers, even um, um, ancestors, if you have them, they will tell you that you should do this. You should prepare a chapati maybe for a um, uh, cow before you fe uh, feed your own self, right? So we have a lot of charitable things that we have to think about the animals around us. We have to think about the people who do not earn well enough. So that is something that is deep in our roots, the charity work, the relief work, the kind of giving donations. But that has been in, uh, now imbibed in our corporate world as well, in our economy as well, in the form of CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Okay, so it, it provides a lot of benefits undoubtedly. This is the whole chart you develop a policy then um, you have to decide that how i am going to implement it that means if you decide okay fine i'm going to provide the midday meal schemes midday meals to all the um, poor people over here so how will you do that you have to collaborate with someone right so who is going to be your implementation partner right that you have to decide that is he efficient enough will he be able to do that right then you get your project approved from the board you finalize the implementing agency then you actually go out to do that then you prog progress the monitoring you monitor the progress that whether how is it going on then you check its impact assessment that means did it create any impact do the people over here know that, okay, this was done by ABC Limited. They really provide a lot of benefit to all of us. So we must also do something for them. So what was the impact that was being created? A report on that. And then reviewing that, what should be our policy in future? Should we work in the same manner? Should we change some activities? What should we do now? Right. So this is how corporate social responsibility should be taken care of. Undoubtedly, when you do that, you have to ensure that you comply with the law as well the law which has been implemented and uh, these are in detail the points the same points that we have discussed before then comes your e-governance what is e-governance the use of information and technology in government departments the government departments have been digitalized earlier we had those physical records which were very difficult to trace and track and everything now they have been computerized now we have MCA portal, everything, forms have been processed online, the taxes are being paid online. So now, they, now the whole environment has been changed, right? So there are different models of e-governance. A short note can be asked on this as well. Models of e-governance or what do you mean by e-governance and comment on the different models. So we have government to citizen, government to employees, government to government and government to business, right? 
And then uh, these are the initiatives which are taken by government in this regard. And um, again, these are also the initiatives or you can say the success stories of government digitalization. XBRL, I'm not discussing over here right now because this we discuss in the chapter of accounts of companies, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's now revise SEBI and SEBI loader, the two chapters which are interconnected to each other. First of all, we are going to discuss about the SEBI Act. In SEBI Act, the first thing that comes into our mind that what is SEBI? So Securities and Exchange Board of India is um, a body and authority which was established even before the act came into force, but it got powers in 1992. So it was established in 19, uh, 1988. However, it got powers, it, got, it became the autonomous body, it got legal character all in 1992. The objective of the act was simple, two objectives, two Prima facie objectives. One is to protect investors' interest, and second is to promote and regulate securities market. So, which authority became the regulator of the securities market? It is SEBI. SEBI is a statutory body as it got its powers from the statute. It is a body corporate according to section number three, which means it has all the powers. Uh, all the features of a body corporate, it has the capacity to sue and be sued in its own name. It is artificial person, perpetual succession and all of that. Now, the basics, the initial sections talk about only the basics of SEBI, that is constitution or composition, which comprises of chairman, a member from Ministry of Finance and a member from Corporate Affairs, a member from Official of RBI, five other members of which at least three shall be whole time. So in total, you have nine members. They all are going to be the persons of ability, integrity and knowledge or expertise in the field of law, finance, eco, accounts and administration. They're going to hold office for five years, five years and part-time members for three years at once. They can be reappointed once their tenure expires, but they have a retiring age of 65 years in both these cases and no age specified for part-time members. However, even before their tenure, that means if a member is appointed for five years, even before their tenure, it may be removed by central government. When central government removes them, central government will give them three months notice or it can straight away give three months salary and ask them to leave. If you want to resign, that you also have to give three months notice to central government and you can resign from the position of member or chairmanship. However, on certain grounds, central government has the power to remove them without any notice when they become insolvent or they become of unsound mind or they are convicted of an offense involving moral turpitude or they abused their position. So in such a situation, central government will just give them an opportunity of being heard and remove them. SEBI will have, of course, a lot of officers and employees as it may deem fit, but SEBI is going to meet at such place and such time as prescribed. However, all the meetings will be presided over by the chairman. So chairman shall preside over the meeting and chairman will also have a casting vote. If chairman cannot be present in any of the meeting, then the members who are present, they amongst themselves will choose a person who is going to preside and have a casting vote. There is a section, section 7A which tells that the members cannot participate, the interested members. Now, when I am going to be interested, if I am also a director of some company and I have some financial interest in the matter which is being discussed before SEBI, then in such a meeting, I will disclose my interest and refrain myself that I am not going to participate. I cannot participate. And in fact, I cannot even vote. I cannot be even part of deliberations. Fine. Then there is a small section, section number 8, which clarifies one thing. Supposedly, there was some defect in the constitution or 
maybe some position of the board was vacant or maybe some procedure was not followed appropriately despite that all the proceedings of securities and exchange board shall remain valid nothing of these sort is going to invalidate the proceedings cb it is the duty of the cb to promote um protect investors interest and promote and regulate securities market just like the objective of the act however there are certain more functions which sebi discharges or certain more powers which sebi has you can uh, consider them either way the power or the function <clears throat> or the duty to regulate stock exchange then there are certain intermediaries intermediaries are the ones which connect the investors and the stock exchange like the brokers uh the share transfer agents registrar to an issue bankers to an issue merchant bankers uh then underwriters portfolio managers then we also have depositories depository participants custodians all of them apart from this we also have some pooled investment vehicles like collective investment scheme venture capital funds mutual funds all of these all of these have to be registered with sebi under section 12 section 12 talks about the registration certificate which each of these intermediaries or these funds must obtain from sebi so they will obtain registration they will be under sebi and sebi is going to regulate all of them apart from this sebi also regulates the self regulatory organizations fraudulent or unfair trade practices are completely prohibited by sebi promoting investors education prohibiting insider trading the whole uh, thing from where it actually started insider trading means what it means you have some unpublished price sensitive information which is not available to public so you have some information which can affect the prices of the stock but that is available only to you and not to general public and that's why you can use this information to your advantage to buy shares or sell shares and make profit thereafter so this is insider trading which is going to be prohibited by sebi and also regulated some big takeovers some substantial acquisition of shares that is also going to be regulated and sebi shall also have the power to call for information information from whom information for doing some inspections under the act and also uh, information from banks officials and all that now after this sebi has the power to carry out inquiry or carry out investigation and um, after this inquiry and investigation sebi has the power to impose penalty because of the contravention and collect the disgorged amount whatever amount you have unfairly earned not really earned but whatever amount you have unfairly taken that disgorged amount shall be transferred to ipef which is going to be established by sebi now there are two sections which have been combined over here uh one is um section 11c and in fact after this 11aa we have power of search and seizure this is also a part of section 11c only so we will read all this we will revise all this collectively see if 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 uh first of all there is any transaction which is detrimental to the interest of investors or if there is non compliance with any of the provisions by any intermediary or by any connected person then sebi has the power to investigate how will sebi investigate sebi will appoint an investigating authority and that investigating authority will investigate and report to sebi during that investigation investigating authority has the power to examine or not take notes on examination in fact retain books and also the power of search and seizure how for obtaining the power of search and seizure investigating authority during investigation first makes an application to the magistrate or judge who will authorize them that yes you can 
right it is like obtaining a warrant right for search so uh, they get the authorization they enter with assistance search and seize whatever documents they have to keep the book still investigation place identification marks and during inquiry or investigation they can also sebi can also suspend trading that this security will not be traded as of now restrain some person that you cannot enter into any security transaction on stock exchange if some office bearer is involved that is some official from stock exchange is involved then they can suspend that office bearer and they can also retain the proceeds or attach some property which they suspect to be any disgorged property or amount right so that can also be done apart from this if the company is indulged in unfair fraudulent trade practices on insider trading then sebi undoubtedly can impose penalty post inquiry fine so sebi has the power to inquire investigate search and seizure and all of that through different different modes now we come back sebi has the power to issue um, uh, direction sebi has the power to levy penalty sebi has the power to make regulations after this we have a section cis which is about one of the uh, pooled investment vehicle what is cis collective investment scheme that is there are a lot of investors who collectively invest to earn profit but they don't manage this fund it is being managed by some other person they don't have any control like mutual fund but obviously cooperative society nbfc insurance pension nidhi chit fund deposit mutual fund or any other notified scheme is not cis other than that if you follow this criteria if you fall under this criteria you are a cis and then you have separate cis regulations to be followed right okay after that we also have a very small section called as cease and desist proceedings that is section 11d which tells if a company is involved in insider trading or man market manipulation then cease and desist order can also be passed by sebi section 12 talks about obtaining registration certificate which i have already told you so every intermediary and all the pooled investment vehicles they all have to obtain a registration certificate board also has the power to cancel or suspend their certificate of registration registration section 12a talks that you cannot have manipulative and deceptive devices there is complete prohibition on the same then we have something called as penalties now there are a lot of sections to hb right so we have a lot of section we have a series of 15 number sections but then i'm not discussing the penalties for revision over here because uh, undoubtedly it's just going to waste your time if i say the penalty that's not going to help you to retain the penalty it is you who can help yourself to learn the penalty so for that we have a penalty summary penalty chart which has been shared with you in the main book you have to review that constantly to learn penalty so ask yourself how much penalty have you remembered there are uh, some penalties which have been clubbed that for all these contraventions the penalty remains the same so you have to learn that penalty and uh, don't ignore it considering it not important or because it seems difficult for you to learn because in this chapter penalty part is very important and relevant so that you are going to revise right away through that Uh, uh, summarized chart and ask yourself what is the even if you don't have the summarized version doesn't matter what matters is that uh, you must learn it so it's only you who can recall it 10 times 20 times and learn it so you have to see whether you know it or you don't if you don't know it if you don't um, uh, if you cannot recall it then hold on for a time a moment and uh, revise it twice thrice four times and then try to learn it okay after that we also have another important part left in the chapter after that we don't have much relevant things power to adjudicate or adjudication and appeals part what is power to adjudicate who has the power to adjudicate of course board 
how will the board impose penalty we have read that sebi has the power to impose penalty but sebi must ensure that there is contravention first of all and then how much penalty should be imposed so for that they have adjudicating officer so not below the rank of division chief can be appointed as an adjudicating officer who shall hold an inquiry uh then they can ask people they can ask for documents if they find the contravention then they will also have the power to impose penalty but whenever they impose penalty they have to take care of three factors factor number 1 how much have you gained factor number 2 how much the other person has suffered the loss and factor number 3 what is your nature of default is it repetitive or is it one time the first time you have done right so considering that they will impose the penalty whatever penalty order has been passed you have to pay that penalty in fact sebi has the power to enhance the penalty after giving an opportunity of being heard within 3 months however in between that comes sat what is sat securities appellate tribunal which is established by central government it has a presiding officer it has some judicial members and technical members they work through benches so every bench shall have one judicial member and one technical member judicial member or first of all presiding officer he can be uh, the judge of supreme court or the chief justice of high court or if someone has been the judge of high court for 7 years then they can also become the presiding officer judicial member judge of high court for at least 5 years technical member uh secretary additional secretary in the ministry or any equivalent post in the government they are appointed for 5 years they can be again reappointed but their retiring age is 70 years their retiring age is 70 years now comes an important section which is 15t where you make an appeal to securities appellate tribunal when can you make an appeal if you are aggrieved by the order of sebi if you are aggrieved by the order of adjudicating officer if you are aggrieved by the order of um, ada and pfrd so under ada and pfrd also the same securities appellate tribunal goes so if you are aggrieved the within 45 days you can appeal they will try and dispose of that means either confirm set aside or modify the order and dispose of your appeal within 6 months so their endeavor will be to dispose of it as expeditiously as possible within 6 months but if you are still aggrieved then you can appeal on a question of law within 60 days to supreme court right okay after this we have sebi loader sebi loader is applicable to all listed entities by listed entities i mean not just the listed companies but also the body corporates which are listed listed means what listed means there are any of the securities debt preference equity idea securitized debt instruments units of mf that is mutual fund security receipts any they are listed on whether main board sme or itp so they will be listed entity and they have to comply with sebi loader if they don't comply it amounts to contravention of sebi act now what are sebi loader regulations first of all we deal with some there are so many regulations there are six schedules also but uh, we will read whatever regulations are there in our syllabus and there which is asked in examination so first of all some common obligations common obligations like what ma'am the kmp director and the promoter and any person who is dealing with the listed entity must comply with the obligation so if you are a listed entity or if you are dealing with listed entity you must comply with these obligations and you must have a compliance officer who will become the compliance officer only a qualified company secretary can become the compliance officer who shall be responsible for prima facie four duties duty number 1 compliance duty number 2 coordination with board stock exchange depositories everyone and reporting to board and all that duty number 3 monitoring the email address of grievance redressal division and duty number 4 following correct procedures apart from that listed entity shall also have a share transfer agent or manage this facility in house then we come to a list of regulations made for board of directors what are these the composition of board 
the board of every listed entity shall have at least 50% directors to be non executive at least 50% directors to be non executive and at least one woman director will be there which is the same requirement as under companies act however if you fall in the category of top 1000 companies then your woman director must be independent so you must have one independent woman director. It can be either the same woman director or you appoint some other woman director who is independent, who fulfills the criteria of independence. Fine. As far as independent directors are concerned, if the chairperson is non-executive, one third of board has to be independent. If the chairperson is also executive, then half of the board has to be independent. If you fall in the criteria of top 2000 companies, then you must have minimum six directors. In Companies Act, we have just basic things, one, two and three, minimum number of directors for OPC, private and public. Here we have six directors if you fall in the top 2000. Okay. The retirement age of non-executive directors, 75 years unless SR is passed. As regards meeting, they will meet for at least four times. The gaps will not exceed 120 days. If you fall in the top 2000 companies, then the quorum higher of one third of strength or three directors with at least one independent director. Now there is incorporation of something more that whatever independent directors are on the board, their performance and the criteria of independence must also be evaluated by the board from time to time. Okay, so that will also be done. There is something more, some limit on directorship as well as on membership of committees, the committee like audit committee, SRC. On directorships, you cannot be a director in more than seven listed entities. If you are MD or WTD in any listed entity, you cannot be an independent director in more than three listed entities. You cannot be an independent director in more than seven listed entities. Simple three things. If you are member of committee, you cannot be a member of more than 10 committees of all the companies. You cannot be a chairman of more than five companies. Committees. Okay. Now we have something called as corporate governance with respect to material subsidiary. What is material subsidiary? We all know subsidiary. Material subsidiary means whose income or net worth exceeds 20% of the consolidated net worth or income. That means if I combine the income of all the subsidiaries along with the listed entity, it's 20%. The income of that subsidiary is more than that amount Then that subsidiary becomes my material subsidiary. And if that is the case, I have to identify all the material subsidiaries and every material subsidiary must have at least one independent director of this listed entity on the board of that company. All the significant accounting transactions shall be periodically brought to the notice of the board of directors of listed entity by that material subsidiary. Before disposing of shares of that material subsidiary in such a manner as it results in a non-subsidiary. That means if I hold 60% shares of that material subsidiary, I am trying to sell 15% shares. That means my shareholding will become less than 50%. So it will no more be my subsidiary. If I want to dispose of shares in such a manner, then before doing this, I must obtain SR in general meeting of this listed entity, then only I can dispose of shares. Now we have some quarterly compliances like what? Investor complaint statement. Complaints at the beginning of the quarter, complaints received, complaints solved or disposed of and complaints at the end within 21 days from the end of quarter. Compliance report as we read in schedule five within 21 days. Shareholding pattern, one day prior to listing, 21 days from end of quarter and 10 days of capital restructuring. That is change in more than 2% of paid up share capital. If that comes within 10 days, it has to be reported. All this is going to be reported to stock exchange. Whenever we come up with any public issue, rights issue, preferential issue, whatever we have issued, we have raised funds. 
till we utilize this funds we have to continue to report on quarterly basis our proceeds our utilization and our deviation that means this was the projection and this is what we have actually utilized so whatever deviation or variation is there that has to be reported till the proceeds are completely utilized financial results within 45 days from end of each quarter then in certain cases we have to intimate about our board meetings to stock exchange in what cases ma'am if in the board meeting we are going to discuss about buyback delisting raising of funds dividend declaration or giving away of bonus if in the board meeting we are going to discuss any of these agendas then at least two clear working days prior of board meeting we must intimate the same to stock exchange likewise if we are going to discuss about the financial results quarterly half yearly annual at least five days prior to board meeting intimate to stock exchange if we are to discuss about changing or altering the rights of the securities holder or uh, we have to uh, we have some debentures issued and we want to change the repayment date then at least 11 working days prior to board meeting we have to intimate to stock exchange we also have to intimate the record date at least 7 working days prior then we have some annual compliances annual compliances annual compliances like what financial result the most important one and the only one that you have to read financial result has to be reported within 60 days of end of financial year apart from that you have your annual report financial results means your audit report as well as your balance sheet pnl your financials right annual report includes the whole set so annual report is given 21 days before agm to all the shareholders for circulation to circulate it and thereafter at agm they can adopt the same right so it is sent now when it is sent to shareholders before or on the same day not later than when it is sent to shareholders before or on the same day the annual report the notice of general meeting has also to be sent to stock exchange as well as placed on the website of the company so that is also an annual compliance which must be done apart from this we have some board of directors committees we have four committees in this chapter audit committee stakeholders relationship committee nomination and remuneration committee as well as rmc that is risk management committee all these four committees are required and they are very important from examination perspective also but then again you have to learn all that content how many number of directors number of independent directors in fact an rmc you can have senior executives also as the members however for quorum you must have at least one director present in the rmc uh, meeting right so these are just the crisp contents that you must learn which can be revised through the summary table okay hi everyone let's now revise the chapter of scri firstly what we have to read in this chapter the coverage of scri that we have is this first we have to read about the applicability which is given in section number 28 then we have to read about certain definitions we have to read about the stock exchange recognition process section 3 and 4 uh, contracts and options in securities listing penalties and then education okay so we'll start with this applicability first of all scri is an act which came into picture for um, in uh, february 1957 for preventing the undesirable uh, transactions and uh, of course regulating the business and uh, regulating or controlling the stock exchange now applicability secra is not applicable on government RBI, local authority, corporations set up under special law, convertible preferential dispensers, etc. Right. So if uh, we say a rural corporation or maybe a government is uh, bringing out any bonds, it need not comply with the 
regulations of SECRA. That means it can bring out on its own. It does not need the platform of stock exchange. Now, we have certain definitions. I'm not discussing all the definitions over here, but securities. What are securities? Securities is a very wide term which includes the shares, bonds, debentures, stock, any marketable securities, the derivatives, units of CIS, units of mutual fund, the government securities, security receipt under surface, then any certificate or any instrument which evidences or acknowledges debt, other instruments which may be notified by government or rights or interest in securities, but it does not include the securities which have risk cover also like ULIP. Okay. So any policy or any security which involves an insurance policy also is not included. Now, we have other definitions also which of course you will review. Now we come to the stock exchange recognition process. Why do we need the stock exchange to be recognized? We all know that the stock exchange is a marketplace where trading happens, right? So if you want to deal in securities, it is going to be through stock exchange. So if you want to make a public offer, it has to be through stock exchange only. You cannot make a public offer other than stock exchange. Of course, it is not applicable for entities on whose SECRA does not apply. Now, according to Section 19, stock exchanges... Other than recognized stock exchanges are prohibited. That means recognition of stock exchange is mandatory. How do you obtain that recognition? Anyone who is desirous can make an application in Form A plus space along with the receipt that we have paid the fees, the bylaws, rules, MOA, AOA to central government. Central government will make an inquiry of all the laws, compliance of condition and everything. And if it is satisfied that in it is in the benefit of trade and it is in public interest, then it can grant the recognition. It can grant the recognition. The recognition will be granted subject to conditions. What type of condition? The central government or CB may impose conditions. What conditions? that whoever will be the member of stock exchange will have this qualification. Secondly, this will be the manner of dealing into contracts. Thirdly, um, you will maintain this books of accounts or you will get this audit done. So these are the conditions which may be imposed by CG. CG has delegated the power to CB. So CB imposes the conditions ideally. Based on that condition, recognition will be granted. Okay, now whatever recognition is granted, it is granted for minimum one year, but then it may be permanent or it may be for a specified tenure. So, if, you specify, if it is for a specified tenure, before the tenure expires, three months prior, you can make an application for renewal. So, along with the fees, you will make an application for renewal and you will obtain the renewal. Okay. Whatever recognition is granted by government will be published in official cassette. Sometimes it may so happen that you are not granted recognition. So for that, an opportunity of being heard will be given and uh, you will be refused on the basis of reason which will also be communicated in writing. Next topic that we have to discuss is the contracts and options in securities. There are two topics consolidated into one. When I talk about contracts, contracts means buying and selling. Right. What we have to read in this contracts, we have to read these things. Section number 13, section 14, section 13A, section 16 and section 15. This is the first thing. What is the first thing? That if... Government is satisfied that maybe in certain area the nature of transactions are such or the quantity of such uh, transactions are such that it is important to declare the transactions as illegal. Central government may by notification in official gazette on the basis of circumstances declare that you cannot enter into contracts in this area. Only the members of recognized stock exchange, that too on the basis of conditions, on the basis of conditions imposed by government can enter into a contract. Otherwise, you cannot enter into a contract with other than members. That will be illegal. 
So in such a situation, you cannot enter. Now, if you enter into such transactions, they will be void. If the members have been instructed certain conditions and they do not follow those bylaws, that will be void. That is given in section number 14. Likewise, section 16 also empowers government to prohibit certain contracts in certain areas. So they can suspend trading. That is somehow the in crux. Okay. We also have a provision called as additional trading flow. So if any stock exchange is desirous of establishing another trading ring, it may make an application to CB and once it gets the approval, it can establish additional trading flow. Then we have members not to act as principal in certain circumstances. We all know that we cannot directly indulge in the transactions or indulge in trading and stock exchange. We have to go through the member only. Right, we are the investor. And member and investor usually have this principal agent relationship. We being the principal and they being the agent. Whatever we instruct, they enter into that transaction on behalf of us. But sometimes we might give them all the authority that this is our money, you can do whatever you want to and develop the portfolio. That means we have authorized them to be the principal not our agent and do whatever we are do, uh, asking them to. Right? It is kind of just for establishing that. So they are acting as principal. In usual circumstances, they cannot act as principal unless they are authorized. So we have to give them written consent and on the basis of that written consent, they can act as principal. However, if we give them oral consent, then also they can enter into transaction, but within three days of entering into transaction, they must obtain this written consent. Okay, so they will not act as a, a principal unless they have a backing written consent. Clear? Okay. But, but if it is an outstanding contract for closing that contract, they can. Then comes your option. So we have two types of option, call option and put option, right to buy, right to sell. What is it? It uh, simply gives you a right that you can buy or you can sell a particular security at some future date within a specified time frame. This is just an option which is given to you and you get this option by paying an option premium. Now, it is upon you whether you exercise this option or not. Of course, you will exercise the option if the circumstances and the prices are in your favor. Right? So then you will exercise, otherwise you will not exercise. Okay. Then we come to listing. There are multiple benefits of listing. The public image gets enhanced. We get better liquidity. We get tax concessions. We get more exposure. As an investor also, we get more information about the company because we are required to disclose the same. And uh, the shares of listed company have better credibility if we want to obtain loans. So there are multiple benefits of the same. Listing happens of security, not of companies. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, how do you go for listing? What is the process of listing? You have to make an application in the prescribed form to recognize stock exchange. One thing is clear that public companies get their securities listed before making a public offer. That is also a compliance as given in section number 40 of Companies Act 2013. Private companies cannot get their securities listed because they are prohibited from making public offer. However, their debt securities may be listed according to CB regulations. I told you that stock exchange has three platforms basically. Main board, SME and IGP, Innovators Growth Platform. So on that, you may have the debt securities of private companies also listed. Whenever you want to list the securities, there is a prescribed procedure form which you have to give to recognize stock exchange. If you're making a public offer and you make an uh, application to two recognized stock exchanges, even if one rejects, you must refund the money. You cannot proceed with the public offer. This is given in section 40. Here also it is written that if there is refusal, then you must refund the money within eight days. If you do not, then the directors and all become personally liable along with the interest of 15% per annum. Okay. So it may be refused 
uh, stock exchange will give you opportunity of being heard and will give you reasons for refusal and may be refused thereafter you have to refund the money supposedly it is granted then you must comply with the listing agreement and even if your list uh, securities are once listed they may be delisted according to section number 21a which states that uh, on the grounds under the act after recording reasons and after giving an opportunity of being heard the securities even though listed may be delisted also we have broadly five types of listing initial listing first time listing for public issue a listed company goes for further public offer listing for rights issue when you provide to your existing shareholders listing for bonus shares when you're capitalizing your profits listing for merger or amalgamation when two companies are being merged and new shares are issued right okay then we have certain penalties starting from section 23a to section 23h where we have generic penalty from 1 lakh to 1 crore you have to review all the penalties then comes your process of adjudication. SEBI can authorize the officer, appoint officer, not below rank of division chief of SEBI to be adjudicating officer. <clears throat> now, what does he do? He holds an inquiry in case of an offense and on the basis of factors. What factors? How much we have gained? How much the other party has suffered loss? Or um, what is the repetitive nature of default? So, based on these three factors can impose the penalty. The penalty, whatever is imposed, say be within three months by passing an order and after giving an opportunity of being heard can enhance this quantum of penalty. If you're aggrieved, appeal to SAT. If you're aggrieved by the order of um, uh, adjudicating officer, then also you can appeal to SAT. So if you're aggrieved by order of SEBI adjudicating officer, you can appeal to SAT within 45 days plus extension. SAT is Securities Appellate Tribunal as constituted under SEBI Act. Sorry. They will ensure that uh, they try to dispose of the appeal as expeditiously as possible within a period of six months. They can confirm, they can modify or they can set aside the order. If you are aggrieved by it, within 60 days you can further appeal to Supreme Court on a question of law. Okay. Thank you. We'll now revise the chapter of Competition Act, Competition Act 2002, right? Fortunately, unfortunately, the term competition has not been defined in the Act, but we must know about what is competition before we can proceed with the chapter, although on the term competition, you won't be asked any question, but competition basically is not the competition that we talk in general parlance with our peers or something like that. No, we are talking about the market rivalry. What type of market rivalry, ma'am? There are so many business entrepreneurs who eventually sell products or sell their services so whatever economic rivalry is going on between such market players to attract the customers that is competition now sometimes it is presumed that competition is not a very good thing but uh, it is undoubtedly one of the best things in economy can be gifted with competition by fair means by healthy means is extremely helpful in increasing the productivity and efficiency of any organization. How, ma'am? If I, as a customer, go out and do not have a choice, like I go out to a departmental store and I have six shampoos out there, I can see the quality, I can compare the prices and I can uh, get the best one suited for me according to my needs but if i don't have a choice and maybe a shampoo is available at a price of ten thousand well i would stop um, like washing with my hairs right so competition helps to reduce the prices everyone tries to become cost effective improves the quality and also brings innovation in the product so undoubtedly competition is something which is needed and uh, from customer's perspective, as well as economy, there is utmost need of competition and it's highly beneficial. Earlier, we had an act, MRTP, which did not really regulate competition, but tried to curb competition somehow. And that's why it was repealed and Competition Act 2002 came into effect, which, which focuses on promoting more of competition because it is healthy, 
on protecting the consumer's interest and ensuring that everyone has the freedom of trade, but preventing those practices which hamper competition, right? So that's why MRTP Act got repealed and we had a new competition act which has nine chapters, actually not nine, I would say one to eight, then eighty, and then nine, right? And it has a few sections in every chapter. Chapter one, preliminary. Chapter two, the most important chapter of this particular act, which talks about three things, anti-competitive agreements, abuse of dominant position and combinations. Then chapter three, it's all about competition commission. And thereafter, we have the other sections one by one in the last chapter miscellaneous. We don't have to read everything, but whatever we have to read out of that, the most important one is chapter two, out of which maximum questions are being asked. Other than that, sometimes composition of CCI and all is also asked, or sometimes appeal is also asked in examination. So the act extends to whole of India, that has come with these objectives, as we discussed. Section 2 talks about the definition, which we are not going to discuss. As and when needed, I'll tell you a few definitions while uh, through our revisions. The very first section, chapter number 2, which talks about basically um, three things. The first thing, anti-competitive agreements, which is given in section number 3. To understand anti-competitive agreements, we first need to understand what do you mean by agreement. When I'm talking about agreement, it need not necessarily be some formal type of arrangement in writing. No, it can be any arrangement, uh, written, oral, formal, informal. It can be any understanding or it can be uh, doing anything together. Like we have decided that you also do this, I'll also do this. So action and concert can also be um, an agreement. And sometimes it may so happen that we have entered into such an arrangement or we have come to such a consensus that it is not something that if you deny, you will be dragged to the court. That means it is something which is not enforceable, but still it will be an agreement. So agreement, maybe it is enforceable. Maybe we have decided something legal that we can make some the other party bound or maybe something illegal. It doesn't matter. It could be an action in concert, it could be an understanding, it could be an arrangement, anything it could be. They are called as agreements. Now, my dear, agreements are of two types, vertical and horizontal. Vertical and horizontal. Vertical means the agreement between different, between enterprises or people and different production chain. What is production chain? You produce the goods, you supply the goods, the goods are being provided, um, uh, delivered, the goods are being sold. So we have the production chain. We procure raw material till the time of it is delivered to the customers. We have that production chain or the supply chain, you may call. Now, in that, you have different, different people. Like we have the manufacturer, we have the wholesaler, we have the retailer, right? We have these type of people. They may be one person, they may be a group of people, right? We have distributors. So we have different, different people in this production chain, right? Now, if, if people are entering into an agreement with each other, let's say my example, I I'm the manufacturer, you can say, of the classes and there is some distributor of the classes. So there are different, different distributor. I enter into an agreement with one of the distributor that you are not going to sell my class below this price. That means I have entered into an agreement of resale price maintenance. Do you think there is anything wrong in it? Well, no, ma'am, you can't say such thing. You can't put such a condition. So I have entered into an agreement like this. So it is ideally not something which is uh, wrong at prima facie or it is not something which is hampering the competition. No, the other people are still competing. Right, you get my point. So we have this vertical agreements. Now, when I talk about horizontal agreements, horizontal means between the same stage of production chain. That is, if I enter into an agreement with all the other law teachers and we come to a consensus that we are not going to sell the classes below 20,000. Now, it is hampering competition. It is not good for the benefit of customers or consumers, right? So this is something which is not good. 
So now listen to me very carefully. When I talk about vertical agreements, they may be good, they may not be good, right, for competition. So prima facie, we presume then that, okay, fine, vertical agreements are acceptable. But if, 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 they create a barrier to new people. That means I am entering into such an agreement that new people are unable to ent enter or I'm driving out the existing competition or I'm hindering the entry or it is not beneficial for the consumers or it is affecting the improvement or development. Then this is going to be considered as having an appreciable adverse effect on competition and hence this agreement will not be um, uh, bring into effect. It is going to be void. Okay, so vertical agreements, prima facie, they're not anti-competitive. However, if this is proved, then they are anti-competitive. So how do we determine whether they're anti-competitive or not? By looking at the factors, right? However, when I talk about horizontal agreements, that means between the same production chain, that is generally between the rivals, they are somehow presumed to be anti-competitive. So we have section three, we have two things. Point number one, any agreement that you enter to, whether horizontal or vertical, is going to be, if on these factors is anti-competitive, that is going to be void. However, there are certain agreements which are presumed to be anti-competitive. That means the people of same production chain, all the manufacturers decided that we are not going to give any um, uh, suppose that they are producing uh, tomatoes, maybe. So they are not going to supply tomatoes for 15 days. If they do not supply tomatoes for 15 days, there will be ample of deficit in the whole nation and then they can inflate the prices, right? So they are limiting the production. What is cartel? Cartel is a very important definition in this particular chapter. Cartel is any group of association or any group of people who are trying to limit or control uh, the price, the production, or the distribution, sale, anything. So collectively, they are coming together and they're limiting or controlling these things. Then that is known as any association, any group of people that is known as cartel. So formation of cartels for this purpose is not allowed and it is presumed to be anti-competitive. Even if you say, no, no, we have come together for this. This was going to be beneficial. No, you cannot prove that. This is going to be presumed to be anti-competitive at the very first place, right? Okay. Likewise, likewise, let's have a look at other examples also. When I talk about uh, the vertical agreements, what are the other examples, ma'am? We have tie-in arrangements where people are being bound. That, okay, fine, if you want this product, you have to buy this product as well. So seller maybe puts some condition that you have to buy this on your second purchase or something, something like that, right? So you are somehow trying or um, binding the other person, right? If that's causing a hindrance to uh, other people to enter into the market, then it may be anti-competitive or any other factor. Otherwise, it will not be anti-competitive. There are many exclusive agreements also, like exclusive supply agreement, wherein you agree, you enter into an agreement restricting in any manner the purchase in the course of his trade uh, from acquiring uh, goods other than those of the seller. That means you are going to acquire only my um, goods, right? So that is exclusive supply. So exclusivity agreements are also there. Sometimes you refuse that, okay, you, I'm not going to deal with you, right? So refusal to supply a product or ser um, service to non-competitors or whatever, there can be a case. And resale price maintenance, I have already told you. So these are all kind of vertical agreements. When I talk about horizontal agreements, one very important thing that you have to remember over here is bid rigging. Is bid rigging. What is bid rigging now? What is bidding? Bidding is auction. The auction is something which promotes competition and should be held in a fair manner. That means if there is a house on auction, five people are there, they are all going to um, bid, right? Somebody bids one crore, somebody two, somebody three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever. Right. So on 10 crore, finally the deal gets closed. 
and one person has to pay 10 crore to acquire that house there was healthy competition there was revenue generated and everything so this is something which is healthy now there could be an agreement between these people that we all are going to submit identical bids or you four don't bid at all now what are they doing they were increasing the price so if they do not bid the person bid at the price of 50 lakhs. So he said that only I will bid and I'll get this house at 50 lakhs and I'll pay all of you one one crore each. He said, fine, we are going to just sit here and not bid at all. So we are going to get one crore for nothing. Great. And if I talk about that particular person, he got the house for four crores by paying one crore each and 50 lakhs. Otherwise, he had to pay 10 crores, so they made a good deal, right? But this is something which is called as bid rigging, right? So this is anything. If you try to squeeze out the bidders or submit identical bids or you enter into an agreement that we are not going to bid against each other, so that is all something which is bid rigging and it is presumed to be anti-competitive. Fine. So we have read it to aspects in section number three in anti-competitive agreements moving on to the next part prohibition on abuse of dominant position now here section number four <clears throat> first thing what do you mean by dominant position see dominant position where when will you be in a position to dominate someone when you have that strength that okay fine if he stays or if he goes i am okay then you'll be able to dominate the other person otherwise you'll never be able to dominate, right? So dominance is a position of strength that you can operate independently. Dominant position is not bad. You may have that position of power. That is not bad. You may have that uh, dominance in you. That is not bad. But if you abuse the dominant position, that is incorrect. And that is something which is prohibited. What is abuse, ma'am? Unfair pricing? You're charging 100 rupees for some product uh, which is just worth rupees 5. So unfair pricing or predatory pricing maybe. You know that you can, you have ample of faith. Supposedly Reliance. Okay. Reliance comes into a new sector like maybe telecom. Uh, and uh, Reliance comes with the plans. Like when Reliance Geo came, it provided like plans. Okay, fine. I'm going to give everything for free. Right. Now, what is it? Reliance has ample of profits in the other sector. So Reliance is in a position, maybe I'm just uh, not um, giving you a real life or practical example. This is something which was permitted. So, of course, there was no abuse of dominant position, which was identified. However, if you look at the angle, you will realize it. What did they do? They tried to somehow bring down the prices all the other telecom operators who did not have that strength maybe were not able to compete right if you provide if you provide a product which everyone else is selling at 10 rupees and you provide the same product at 5 rupees then how long will the other competitors be able to survive because everyone will come to you so they are making no profits they are not even able to recover their cost so ultimately a time will come when they will be driven out of the market and then you can increase the prices just like Reliance Geo did. They could increase the price now. Now they can charge whatever price they want to because a lot of consumers or customers have migrated to the, the network, right? So this is called as predatory pricing. Please don't ask me, ma'am, how it was allowed and when it was allowed and all that, right? It depends upon case to case. We have a CCI. We have a Competition Commission of India which also decides whether it is dominant position or not, whether there's abuse or not and thereafter they pass orders, thereafter they do things, right? We are just discussing the... Uh, simple case. Limiting production, as we discussed above, barrier to entry or using position. Now, how do you get to know whether you have that dominant position or not? See, I may be a new entrant, right? Um, I may be a new person and I have just come to the market. I'm trying to make a place in the market and that's why I'm giving things for free or I'm doing this or I'm doing that, right? So you can do that. You can do that. Reliance did that. Reliance was new to the sector. So Reliance did not enjoy the dominant position in the tele telecom sector. So if you identify that relevant product market, then Reliance was new. Reliance was not enjoying the dominant position. And since there was no dominant position, there's no point of abuse. Right. 
So likewise, we need to determine whether there was a relevant, in which market are we talking about with respect to the product or with respect to the geographical region. I may be very dominant at a particular place. I may not be very dominant at the other place. So which relevant market are we talking about? And then we determine the uh, dominance on the basis that how much market share do I have? What is the size of my enterprise? What is the size of other competitors? How much consumers are dependent upon me? And what is the market structure? So based on that, it is being decided that whether a person enjoys a dominant position or not. And if a person enjoys a dominant position, thereafter inquiry happens by CCI under Section 19, whether there's prohibition or whether there's abuse of dominant position or not. If there is, then thereafter orders are being passed. So these all we read in Section number 1931 later, right? Fine. Then we come to combination. Section number five. A lot of mergers that happen, supposedly two companies are being merged into one. We have to look at the provisions of Companies Act. We also have to, maybe they are listed, we have to look at a lot of SEBI compliances. We also have to look at the provisions of Competition Act. Because if the big giant market players, they come together, maybe they may create a monopoly in and after creating monopoly, they may hinder the competition. So somehow it is important to keep a check on them whether we should allow this merger or not. So CCI plays a very important role. Competition Commission of India plays a very important role in approving these combinations. And every merger has to be approved by CCI? No. You may acquire shares, you may acquire assets, you may acquire control. If it exceeds the threshold, ma'am, what is the threshold? See, there is a huge section number five and it's given in different, different parts, but we have it, a summarized version, which I've shared in the notes as well. So with that summary, you have to recall that limits. And if it exceeds that limit, if it exceeds the threshold, then that is going to be termed as combination. Now, you cannot enter into any combination which is creating an appreciable adverse effect on competition. So you have to make an application to CCI and once CCI approves your combination thereafter only it will be treated as valid. So any person or enterprise if they're entering into any combination they have to get the board's approval and within 30 days they have to submit the proposal for approval to CCI. Now CCI will reply within 210 days. If CCI does not reply within this time, then it is deemed acceptance. So if they reply, great. If they reply as negative, then you cannot enter into that combination. If they don't reply, even better because it is deemed acceptance. Fine. Okay, fine, ma'am. Now, um, CCI may also inquire into the same. Now, the next set or the next part that we have is Competition Commission of India. What is Competition Commission of India, CCI, that we have been talking so far? Central government establishes this Competition Commission of India, which is going to be a body corporate. First of all, it's composition, chairperson, minimum two members, maximum six members. In case there is a vacancy, senior most person will take charge. And they are going to be appointed from the selection committee, which is going to uh, maintains a panel. And from that, the appointment takes place for five years. Retirement age 65 years. They have to take an oath of office and secrecy before they enter the office. Right. Once they're appointed, they're not appointed for life. They can resign by giving three months notice to central government. Central government may permit to re uh, go earlier. They can also be removed by CG when, if... Uh, they acquire some other employment because during their membership, employment is not allowed if they turn insolvent, incapable or offense. Right. On these grounds, they can be removed. Right. Clear. <clears throat> but if they acquired financial interest or if they abused their position, which everyone will deny that, no, I have not acquired any uh, financial interest or I have not abused my position. If any member of CCI abuses their position, then in such a case, if they have been um, uh, uh, put allegation on these two grounds, then first of all, CG will refer to Supreme Court. Supreme Court will hold an inquiry and present a report and thereafter CG will remove them. On other grounds, CG can remove them directly. 
right during membership you are not allowed for any other paid employment and after termination also you are not allowed for two uh, till two years in connection with any prior party any um, enterprise which has been a party to cci prior to that you cannot be um, uh, employed in that for two years and others it's allowed right coming back to our main chart so composition i think is clear what powers do they have? They have the power to inquire. They have the power to pass order. They have a lot of miscellaneous powers, powers to make rules, regulations, a lot of things are there. Duties are given in section number 18. They are the same duties as we talk about the objectives of the Act. So whatever objectives of the Act, the same duties have been conferred to CCI also. Meetings, we'll read section number 22, office, head office at Delhi and offices at other places in India. Fine, ma'am. Meetings. So they are going to meet at such place and time as prescribed. Quorum three members share person presides over the meeting. If he is not present, the senior most person will preside over the, over the meeting. The decisions will be taken uh, by majority, and there will be a casting vote for uh, of the chairperson. Now, after we read this whole part of Competition Commission of India, we also have something called as Appointment of Director General. So, for the purpose of assisting the Competition Commission, Central Government also appoints Director General and then there will be officers, other employees and all that part. Right. Then we come to one of the most important sections again, section number 19, which talks about inquiry into Section 3, Section 4. Section 3 means anti-competitive agreement. Section 4 means dominant position. So reference may be made to CCI by central government, state government or statutory authority. So central uh, CCI receives some information from these people or on receipt of some other information or CMO2 also. CCI may hold an inquiry that some enterprise has contravened Section 3 or Section 4. Of course, keeping in view the factors. What factors, ma'am? The same factors that we have read in the respective sections. That if you want to determine the appreciable adverse, whether a, an agreement has appreciable adverse effect or not, you have to check whether it uh, hinders the entry of new entrants or something like that, right? If I talk about dominant position, how much market share you have, what is the size of your enterprise, what is the size of your competitors? So the same factors that we have read before. And based on that, CCI passes the order. We have an elaborate procedure of inquiry, which is being given that how inquiry takes place under section 19. Reference is made by CCI, right? Okay. We look at the reference, we find that there is no prima facie case, we'll dismiss it. CCI is going to dismiss it. But if they find that, okay, fine, prima facie, we think that, okay, investigation should be done. So they will direct the director general that you prepare an investigation report and thereafter forward to the parties concerned. Now, director general recommends that, yes, there is investigation, there is contravention. So further inquiry will take place. If they recommend that there is no contravention, then we need to see how the inquiry was initiated. Was it initiated because a reference by CG, SG or SA was made? If yes, then we must look at their perspective. Why did they made a reference? Because according to the Director General's report, there is no contravention. So we will invite their comments. And based on their comments, if we find that, yes, prima facie case exists, then we will proceed with the reference and further inquiry will take place. If no, then we'll return the reference. If it was some other, we'll just give the opportunity of being heard to whoever informed us. And then further inquiry is not needed. If it is needed, it will be carried out. Otherwise, it will be dismissed. Based on the inquiry, uh, we come, CCI comes to a conclusion that um, whether there were anti-competitive agreements or whether there was pro there was abuse of dominant position, right? If yes, these are the orders which may be passed by the commission. They can impose penalty. These are the maximum penalties which may be imposed. They can ask to discontinue whatever you are doing and not to re-enter, modify whatever agreement you have made 
or maybe pass other orders or maybe divide the dominant enterprise, maybe pass order for division. So this is also something which is possible. Next, we come to combination. Right. Now, listen to me. Every prospective combination has to give an application to CCI and approve and get their approval and thereafter you can enter into combination. But there may be some mergers which did not get the approval of CCI, but still they have merged. So there could be some combination which has taken effect without CCI's approval. And CCI got this information CO-Moto or on some source. So within one year of the combination taking effect, if they find that no, prima facie, there is no appreciable adverse effect on this merger, on this combination. Combination is the merger which exceeds the threshold. Fine. Acquisition which exceeds the threshold. So if there is prima facie, no appreciable adverse effect, they'll just impose penalty and pass orders, whatever they think like. But if there is appreciable adverse effect, then this combination cannot take place unless we inquire and assure that this is not going to happen. So they will issue show cause notice to the parties to respond within 30 days that why we should not carry out investigation. After the receipt of response from the parties, within seven days, they will, we, uh, CCI will direct the parties that you publish all the details to bring it to the public knowledge. And the public will file objections if they have. CCI can ask for additional information. CCI will also refer to the Director General and ask for their report. What do they think? And after considering the objections, after considering the DG's report, after considering the, all the information that has been uh, obtained, they will pass the orders according to Section 31. That means they may approve your combination, they may reject your combination, or they may ask to modify the combination. Now, you have agreed to merge on certain terms and now some authority is asking you to modify the terms. You may not accept it. If you accept it, fine, the combination takes place. If you do not accept it, then no combination. Supposedly, you also have some amendment in mind and you say, okay, fine, we accept this, but slightly change this also. Then you can submit your amendment. If the commission agrees, approve. If the commission disagrees, they'll give you 30 days to accept this modification that they suggested. If you accept it, approval. If you don't accept, then it is considered to have appreciable adverse effect. And this is a combination which will not be allowed. So we have this elaborate section number 31, which talks about all of that, right? Apart from that, CCI has the power to issue interim orders also. If you want to appear before CCI, you can appear in person or you can take the help of some representative like chartered accountant or company secretary or cost accountants or legal practitioners. Commission has the power to um, regulate their own procedure. They're not bound by code of civil procedure. They can rectify the orders. Uh, there are sections of penalties, section 43, 43, 42. So you have to read about that penalties also. Then comes a section which is almost common in many of the acts, um, contravention by companies. So if companies do this offense, of course, they cannot be put behind the bars. So there is officer in default also who takes charge. Then you have something called as <laughs> competition advocacy. What is competition advocacy? See, with regard to competition, central government makes a lot of policies. Now, whatever policies central government is making, central government gives a reference to CCI. CCI within 60 days give their opinion. Now, they are only giving their opinion that this should be made or this should be made with this modification because on ground, real grounds, uh, or practical grounds, they are the ones who are working. Ground reality, they know it better, right? So their opinion counts a lot, but it's not going to bind central government or state government, right? They prepare, they constitute a fund, which is called as competition fund, where the money comes from central government and out of that fund, all the salaries and everything is being paid, accounts are being maintained, audit is being done, and uh, returns are also being filed. Apart from that, we have something called as appeals. If you're unhappy with the orders of CCI, you can go to CAT. If you're unhappy, you can go to Supreme Court. 
CCI is Competition Commission of India. CAT is Competition Appellate Tribunal, which ideally does not exist now. The powers and the functions have been taken over by NCLAT. Right, so we do not have ideally competition appellate tribunal now, but we read this only in our act. So this is not very relevant, but the chairperson, maximum two members, I'm not teaching you the composition. I'm not revising the composition with uh, you because I don't think this should ever be asked in examination, although it can be. So you must read it once. Right, and then thereafter you can make an appeal to Supreme Court within 60 days if you are still dissatisfied. Sometimes commission can be superseded by central government. So if they do not discharge their functions the way they are supposed to, central government can super, uh, supersede that. Central government can also make rules. The commission, uh, CCI, has the power to make regulations. So all that miscellaneous, trivial sections which are not very relevant and um, we are not considering them as a part of our revision. Right? Thank you. Okay, so now the revision of Foreign Exchange Management Act 1996. Now, uh, let's come straight to the point that is the first relevant topic, residential status. But before we read residential status, before we revise it, we also need to know who a person is. So a person is an individual, HF, company, partnership firm, LLP, any body of individuals, association of persons, all of that. Apart from that, a person, any branch, office or agency is also a person. So they are also separately distinguished as persons and their residential status is also need to be determined. Fine. But why do we need to determine the residential status? Because we have to make rules for entering into, uh, entering into foreign exchange transactions. Ma'am, what is foreign exchange transactions? First thing you have to understand is what is foreign exchange? Foreign exchange includes foreign currency. What is foreign currency? Foreign currency means any currency other than Indian currency, that is INR. What is Indian currency? INR, of course, but what is currency? Currency does not necessarily mean the currency notes, but it includes the letters of credit, the checks, travelers, checks, postal orders, money orders, everything, right? So a lot of part is included in currency, Indian currency, Anything other than Indian currency is foreign currency and foreign exchange is beyond foreign currency because it also includes the deposits, etc., which are payable in foreign currency and some other things. So ultimately, foreign exchange is something for which rules are made. Why? Because the government is regulating the same. Okay. So first thing is to determine the residential status. You can be a person resident in India or you can be a person resident outside India. Who a person is that you already know. Now, this residential status, when we have to determine for an individual, how do we determine that? If I have to check, if I have to enter into any foreign exchange transaction, I um, want foreign exchange, I want dollars, will I get it or will I not get it? That depends upon my residential status, that whether I am a PRI or whether I am a PRY, right? So if I reside for more than 182 days in previous year, that is the first condition which must be fulfilled for me to become a PRI. If that condition is not fulfilled, straight away I am a PRY. That means even if I have come for employment from some other country, but then I do not fulfill this first condition, I will be a PRY. If I fulfill this condition, then still some things need to be checked. That is condition number two needs to be checked. Why have I come out? Why have I come to India? I have come to India and in the previous year, I was in India for more than 182 days. Supposedly, I am not residing permanently in India. I have come to India. So why have you come to India? If I have come to India for business, for vocation, for uh, employment or for an uncertain period, then they'll consider me as PRI because now I'm here to permanently settle down. But if I've just come to India for some visit or anything like that and I've stayed for some longer tenure, they will not consider me as PR, uh, PRI. So I will be a PROI. I hope you can find and trace it in the chart. Now, if I have gone out of India, so why I have gone out of India? 
have i gone out of india i was there in the previous year for more than 182 days if i have gone out of india for an employment business vocational uncertain period then i am a pri from the same day when i go out of india i cease to be the pri and i become pri but if i have just gone out for some visit and all i will still be a pri now we come to persons other than individual persons other than individual that means a company llp anything like that so if they are incorporated in india pri not incorporated in india pri but the branch office or agency they are not incorporated anywhere they are located so if they are located in india undoubtedly pri but if not located in india that means located outside india then in all the cases they are not pri sometimes if there is a branch supposedly a company is here but branch is somewhere else that branch is controlled by this indian company so that branch will also be a pri so any branch office agency which is controlled by or owned by pri then that will also be a pri otherwise it will be a pri now after we have known the residential status the question is uh, how can you get foreign exchange so no person can deal in foreign exchange according to section 3 on its own you need someone who is authorized to do so we have someone called as authorized person about which we read in section number 10 though i will tell you there are three basic authorized person authorized dealer which is the banks money changer and offshore banking unit so only they are authorized person to deal in foreign exchange so if we want foreign exchange for any purpose supposedly my relative stays abroad or my, i am going out of india then i will need some money undoubtedly so i need dollars where will i get dollars from from these authorized person only i cannot get dollar from anywhere else i cannot make any payment outside india i cannot receive any payment from outside india just like that i cannot acquire any asset outside india but we all have that right uh, there are people who have that right so this whole section 3 is sub is uh, written like uh, except as otherwise provided in the act so if any uh, provision of act if any rule if any regulation if any master direction circular anything permits then that can be done so it's not that these transactions are prohibited these things are prohibited no generally this is the instruction which is given except as otherwise provided under the act then come to uh, section number 4 which talks about holding of foreign exchange so i cannot hold dollars i cannot acquire i cannot hold i cannot own possess transfer anything not foreign exchange not foreign security not immovable property however there are provisions which permit the same so according to those provisions i can hold i can transfer i can possess i can do those things clear fine there are two types of transactions and the two most important things that we have in this chapter current account transactions and capital account transactions both are defined in section number 2 capital account transaction any transaction which alters my that is assets foreign assets and liabilities of pri or indian assets and liabilities of pri what is current account transaction anything other than that but current account def uh, transactions definition specifically includes four things if you are making payment for trade that is import export it is current account transaction if uh, there is short term credit short term credit uh, as we have discussed buyers credit suppliers credit they all are current account transactions interest on loans income from investment living expenses for your children parents spouse travel expenses education expenses medical expenses for your children parent spouse right along with your own self so they are all current account transactions now two things we have read so far residential status and the uh, transactions that means ma'am if i want to travel abroad it is a current account transaction is it permitted i mean we have made the classification but how do we come to know that we can enter into such transaction or not so current account transactions are all freely permissible unless they are prohibited they require approval of cg of rbi okay 
सो वी रीड करेंट अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन सेक्शन फाइव रेड विद फॉरन एक्सचेंज मैनेजमेंट करेंट अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन रूल्स टू थाउजेंड ऑल दीज आर फ्रीली परमिसेबल अनलेस सो वी रीड दीज विद दीज रूल्स एंड रूल नंबर थ्री फोर एंड फाइव आर इंपॉर्टेंट एंड शेड्यूल वन टू एंड थ्री ऑफ दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट राइट सो इन शेड्यूल वन वी हैव अ लिस्ट ऑफ प्रोहिबिटेड करेंट अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन फॉर विच यू कैन नॉट गेट फॉरन एक्सचेंज लेट्स हैव अ लुक एट दैट लिस्ट सी दे दे आर ऑल परमिसेबल अनलेस दे फॉल इन द लिस्ट ऑफ रूल थ्री शेड्यूल वन प्रोहिबिटेड ट्रांजेक्शन रोल ऑफ फॉरन एक्सचेंज इज नॉट अलाउड If you are traveling to Nepal and Bhutan, obviously there are uh, Indian rupees freely convertible, freely acceptable. So you don't need foreign exchange for travel to that places, and you will not get foreign exchange for the same. And then there is a list which is given in Schedule One. Uh, if you want to, if you have earned a lottery and you want to remit that lottery money out of India. you will not get foreign exchange for that if you want to uh, get foreign exchange for purchasing some lottery ticket or some magazine which is banned no if you want to pay commission on exports you will get foreign exchange but not to joint venture or wholly owned subsidiaries if you want to pay commission on exports under rupee state credit route no rupee state credit route is a kind of arrangement between two governments okay uh, where in government is giving you a platform that you export so why do you need to pay commission dividend balancing sometimes dividend uh, is required to be balanced with an equivalent amount of uh, inflows only then outflows are allowed so it has going to be balanced so uh, ultimately foreign exchange is not required call back services that means you are not using indian telecom operators instead you are using a telecom operator of some other country that is person is calling you back and is connecting you to some other country so this is ideally which has been uh, stopped also and uh, Uh, for this you will not get foreign exchange likewise nrsr account has also been discontinued but the interest of it will not give you foreign uh, exchange okay so this is a huge list i know but then you have to learn it in fact uh, it is being dealt in classes in such a manner that i don't think any student anywhere you it doesn't matter uh, where you are studying how you are studying but you take it repeatedly so ultimately you end up learning it i am sure okay then we have schedule 2 the transactions given in schedule 2 requires central government approval now here central government means through respective ministries so central government works through its respective ministries and those ministries will give you permission so draw all obtained if draw all allowed if approval obtained first thing cultural tours ministry of hrt so if you want to go for any cultural tour and you want foreign exchange for that you have to get approval from ministry of human resource development in fact there is a proper department department of education and culture from where you get permission then these coming three points are for psus specifically if they want to get advertisement done in print media which the amount of which exceeds 10000 usd they will not get for an exchange unless they get approval from the ministry of finance department of economic affairs however in three cases they can uh, they uh, get for an exchange without cg's approval when when they want to advertise their tourism or for international bidding or for investments freight of vessel by psu so if psu has to pay freight for a harega vessel then foreign exchange will be given only when you obtain the permission from ministry of surface transport if psu or <coughs> government department is making imports on cif basis that is cost insurance freight everything they are bearing then also they need approval same ministry of surface transport multi modal transport operators who are they the operators who get the goods transport from one place to another but they are using different modes of transport not just one mode that is not just by truck but maybe my truck sea truck something like that right so in such a situation the facility that they use abroad that is their agent they might they collect money in inr but they have to pay their agent in foreign exchange so for this payment you need to obtain a registration certificate from the director general of shipping 
hiring charges of transponders if uh, you want some of your show to be telecasted somewhere else then you have to pay uh, for that right so you need to per obtain permission from ministry of information and broadcasting container detention charges the huge containers wherein the um, goods are being filled and they are being exported or they are being shipped right so those containers are being hired and you have to pay charges from them if you detain it for long then you have to pay more charges right in such a situation there is a rate which is prescribed by the director general of shipping and if you exceed that rate that means you need more funds to pay for that then you need to obtain the permission and thereafter uh, you can pay it prize money sometimes uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, activities which happen abroad so international national and state level uh, sports bodies can sponsor any amount but if we want to sponsor any amount then 1 lakh usd is the upper capping after that we need to obtain the permission from ministry of hrd again department of sport, youth affairs and sport then membership of p and i club protection and indemnity club this is again for a kind of ship insurance but for that you need cg's approval okay insurance division of ministry of finance fine now first schedule prohibited second schedule cg's approval third schedule this is like freely permissible kind of transactions they have a capping they have given you a limit if you do the transaction within this limit no approval beyond this limit rbi's approval is needed what is the limit there is a huge limit which has been given uh, 2 lakh 50 thousand usd per financial year per person right so huge limit has been given so if within the limit uh, within prescribed limit draw without rbi's approval it exceeds the prescribed limit then approval is needed for what transactions ma'am private visits there are some specified transactions and then there is a buffer all kind of capital account transactions are covered here and this they are prohibited than others private visit if you go on a private visit to any country other than nepal and bhutan because for there you don't need foreign exchange so if you visit any country then you can get up to 250000 usd without any approval if you want to gift if you want to donate if you are going out for employment if you are immigrating you are shifting to another company country maintenance of your close relatives abroad for your business travel for your medical treatment for your studies and all other types of capital account transactions are covered here there are three stars which i have made four stars some people might say immigration medical treatment and studies now these are three expenses for which 250000 usd might not suffice because if medical treatment is very huge and expensive then uh, every time obtaining rbi's approval will be a little difficult and even rbi will be occupied with so many applications so for them it is written that it is permissible up to your actual expenditure so even if, if your actual expenditure is more than 250000 usd then also it is allowed it is permitted fine ma'am so these for for individuals now we have some permissible things for other than individuals also so they also have a limit if it exceeds that limit you need rbi approval if it is within the limit you don't need rbi's approval but what is the limit the limit is uh, separately given for each type of transaction the first thing supposedly there is a company who wants to donate donate for creation of church or a contribution to any educational institute or to any technical institute which is working in the same field up to this amount what amount this amount has to be calculated this amount will be lower of 1% of your exchange earnings of 3 years or 50 lakh usd so whatever amount comes up to this amount you can donate without rbi's approval more than this amount you need rbi's approval if you want to pay commission you have a flat in india you have sold it to some foreign person who was brought by an agent abroad so you have to pay commission to that agent for which you need foreign exchange the maximum amount that you can get without approval is the amount calculated which is higher of 25000 usd or 5% of inward remittance next you are paying for consultancy services consultancy services have a huge capping 
if it is infrastructure consultancy up to 1 crore usd you don't need rbi's approval and for others 10 lakh usd if you have to pay for pre incorporation expenses for that or then higher of 5% of investment which has come or usd 1 lakh right okay fine ma'am of course, all those transactions you have to learn because a lot of questions are being asked from current account transactions and capital account transactions. So uh, this is the summarized version. Section 5, they're freely permissible unless these three. So there are three things that we have to learn. Coming to capital account transactions. Now, unlike current account transactions, their nature is kind of reverse. They say that current account transaction allowed only if permitted. So they have a list of permitted things. They don't have the list of general things that everything is permitted except this prohibited. Of course, they have a list of prohibited transactions as well. However, they also have a list of permissible transactions. So some permissible transactions. Here, one important difference that you must keep in mind. Section 6 read with foreign exchange management. Capital Account Transaction Regulations 2000. There we had rules prescribed by central government. Here we have regulations specified by RBI. Okay, so in that regulation, we have Schedule 1, we have Schedule uh, 2. Okay, so there is some permissible transactions for PRI. It is given in Schedule 1. For PROI, it is given in Schedule 2. Then we also have some prohibited transactions and we have certain types of transactions on which restriction cannot be imposed. Okay. Uh, first thing, the transactions on which never CG or RBI, no one is going to impose restriction. That is amortization of loan, that is repayment of loan, depreciation of direct investment. Direct investment means investment in equity. If that depreciates, you have to pay more. That is, if it is in a loss, then you have to pay more. Then that transaction, no prohibition, no restriction will be ever imposed. Okay, fine now. There are some transactions on which prohibited prohibition is there. Like, a person resident outside India cannot come to India and invest in chit fund, nidhi companies, our agriculture and plantation activities, our real estate, including the construction of farmhouse, but real estate does not include the development of townships, uh, residential com commercial premises, roads, bridge, investment trust and everything. And TDR. TDR is transferable development right now this is a kind of certificate which is issued by government to us if we want to compulsorily acquire a particular if government compulsorily acquires a particular uh, property then it issues us a certificate which is transferable so we can give this development right to someone else as well now what are the permissible transactions for pri they are given in schedule one so PRI, that is, I am a person resident in India. I can invest in foreign securities subject to all the regulations. Okay. I can take loans from outside India. I can get uh, immovable property from outside India. Uh, not uh, get it, but uh, acquire. I can give a guarantee in favor of PROI. Although it is a contingent liability, if PROI doesn't pay, I will pay. So I am creating a kind of my contingent liability. But it is permitted. Now, import or export, although is a matter of current account transaction, yet import export of currency is a matter of capital account transaction. Then, even if I am getting loans in Indian rupee by PROI, that is also a capital account transaction. Maintaining a foreign a currency account is also capital account transaction because they're also everything. Uh, I have a constant liability created. Oh, sorry. I have a constant uh, foreign uh, reserve created. Now, foreign currency account, I have told you, we can have RFC account. We can have EEFC account. A person who comes back to India brings a lot of foreign exchange. He can hold it in his RFC account. He can take back whenever he want to. EEFC account, the exchange earners. I am an exporter. I earn a lot of foreign exchange. I'll keep it in my account. Uh, I get saved from all that current foreign exchange fluctuations. I can use it as and when needed. So these are the foreign currency accounts, which maintaining means 
capital account transaction. I can get an insurance policy from outside India. I can give loan to PRY. <clears throat> I can remit out of capital assets or I can enter into derivative contracts like uh, depository receipts. So these are permissible transactions for PRI. Now the same thing, permissible transactions for PRY. They can get securities in India. They can invest in India. They can acquire or transfer movable property. They can give guarantee in our favor. They can export import currency. They can give deposits. They can hold bank account, foreign currency account in India. They can remit the capital assets uh, out of they can enter into derivatives contract. So everything is exactly the same for PRY also. Okay. Now, after this, we have a section called as section 8, which tells us uh, to, which gives us or imposes a duty on us. If I am an exporter, I have exported goods rupee, worth rupees 50,000 USD, then it's my duty that I realize that payment and bring it to India. Right. Government is promoting so much exports or government is helping so that more foreign exchange reserves come here. So it is my duty that I realize and repatriate. Now, what do you mean by repatriation? Repatriation does not simply mean that bringing it to India. You have to bring it into India. You can either sell it to the authorized person. So it just gets inject, injected into the system or you can hold it in your permitted currency account that is EEFC. So if you hold it in that, that is also meaning repatriation. So you have no non-compliance or if I have taken a foreign loan, I collect some payment and I repay that foreign loan so that Government here does not has to extract foreign exchange for repayment of loan. That means government saved its foreign exchange. Any saving is inflow. So inflow as good as repatriation. So these three conditions are all repatriation. And it is the duty to repatriate. Then comes your authorized person. Although I have already told you they are known. They are known as authorized person. If you anyone wants to become an authorized person, they have to make an application to RBI, comply with all the conditions and a written authorization is given to them. But then they have to comply with the provisions, rules, regulations, everything. They also have to comply with the directions of RBI. If they do not comply with the directions or provisions of the act or rules or regulations or in public interest also, their uh, authorization may be revoked. Their authorization may be revoked. Then we have two sections, 11 and 12. RBI has the power to give directions to authorized persons. If you do not comply, penalty 10,000 plus 2,000 per day of default. RBI also has the power to authorize some officer for inspection. So that officer, what will he do? He can go inspect and verify that authorized person is giving us the information, whether it's correct or not. Some information they are hiding, so how to obtain more information or just to secure that, yes, they are complying with the acts, provisions and everything. So this is a very small, small section. Then we have section number seven, export of goods and services. Now, export does not mean sale. It means taking or sending out of India. It could be goods, it could be services also. Now, whenever you are exporting or as of that matter, whenever you are importing also, government wants full information because government wants to ensure how much exports are there, how much imports are there, what is the balance of payments, whether exports, the foreign exchange is being realized or not. If you're making imports, whether the payment has been made or not, everything. So how much payment made, how much foreign exchange realized, governments want to reconcile because ultimately foreign exchange reserves is not our property. It is government's property. We don't have the right to hold it uh, just like that. Okay. So for that, government has made import regulations also and export regulations also. In exports, we have to, we means an exporter has to file a declaration which tells us all our particulars about export, uh, sorry, export of goods, about export of services also. 
For export of goods, we have a form EDF and SoftX. SoftX in case of software and EDF in all other cases. But for services, we don't have any form. So we don't file declaration. But then it's still our duty to realize and repatriate payment. Now, when we file declaration, we have to give all the details, including export value. Sometimes we can ascertain this export value that this is our value and this is what we will realize when everything is finalized pre-hand. But sometimes it is not ascertainable and subject to certain conditions. So what is something that you expect to receive? So that expected value has to be given in the declaration, right? So that is about exports. Okay, let's now revise the chapter of Banking Regulation Act 1949. The first thing that we need to know before we read the act is uh, some brief history, right? So what history is very important is that which was the first bank which is still in existence, that is SBI. Now, was it SBI? No, it was ideally Bank of Calcutta, which was, which was renamed as Bank of Bengal. Then two other banks came, all three were merged, they became bank, Imperial Bank and thereafter SBI came into picture, right? So we have SBI, which is the oldest bank. Of course, uh, it is all governed by RBI, right? Uh, um, all the banking sector comes under RBI. If I talk about the banking sector, it has been classified into two types of banks, scheduled banks and non-scheduled banks. What are scheduled banks which come under the second schedule of RBI, right? We can say that further scheduled banks are being classified as nationalized, are the private sector, regional, rural, foreign, etc. Et now, what do banks do in general? Banks accept deposit and lend loans. There can be different forms like savings bank, current, FD, RD, cash certificate. The very first section that we read in this act, Prime of PC, is section number six, which talks about the different forms. Uh, or different forms of business in which the banking companies may engage. What are the different forms of business? They can be the agent, uh, insure, uh, guarantee, underwrite, transact every kind of un guarantee or uh, indemnity business. They can sell uh, or realize their claims. They can hold the property. They can un execute trust. Uh, they can... Uh, undertake uh, things relating to lease, right? And uh, then they may uh, undertake any business, right? Or do anything which, anything which is incidental to their business, to the promotion or advancement of their business. Now, although this list is exhaustive, but it is not comprehensive, that means it contains everything, but it has not been given in detail. So we have a lot of hidden services or general utility services which are being performed by banks, which can be a part. Like we, I discussed with you, we have locker facility. Now, section... Um, different, different sections, section 18, section 42. Prima facie, we have two basic requirements of SLR and CRR. What is it? Every bank accept deposits. Now, whatever deposits banks are accepting is liability from bank's perspective. And there are two types of liabilities. One is demand liabilities and the other is time liabilities. Demand liabilities that we have to pay as and when demanded and time liability, which is for a fixed period like fixed deposits. Demand liabilities like savings. Now, whatever are your total deposits, that is your time and demand liabilities, net demand and time liabilities, a certain percentage of that has to be kept with RBI in a current account opened with RBI on which you do not get any interest. That is known as cash reserve ratio and a certain portion or certain percentage has to be kept in liquid assets. I am writing it over here. 4.5 and 18.5. You write this, although this is not at all needed, right? I have told you different, different ratios, different, different percentage. The current percentages are not asked, but still you can write this, right? They have to be maintained in liquid assets. Liquid assets means what? Maybe gold or maybe some investments or securities which are approved, right? So that they are readily available as cash. So whatever you receive, 
you have to keep certain portion as CRR, certain as SLR, certain as other statutory requirements, certain you have to transfer to reserve fund also, then you have to keep for your day-to-day -day expenses and then whatever is available can be given as loans. We have an important set with respect to board of directors. At least 51% of the person should have specialized knowledge. Specialized knowledge in what field? Accountancy, agriculture, banking, finance, law, small scale industry or any field which in the opinion of RBI has relevance in the banking sector. Okay. Now the directors and uh, other than chairman and WTD are going to hold office for 8 years and others for 5 years. Who can become the chairman? The chairman can be the whole time member, whole time director or part time director as well. In case he is the whole time director, he is entrusted with all the responsibilities. In case he is part time, then we have managing director which comes into picture and he is entrusted with all the responsibilities. Okay, So Reserve Bank has the power to appoint that. Then we have something with respect to capital. Now, Section 11 uh, prescribes the requirement of minimum capital by a banking company, which we don't have to study. But Section 12 uh, provides something more, which is that subscribed capital should be more than equal to half of authorized capital and paid up capital should be more than equal to half of subscribed capital. So this is something that you have to learn. Whenever there is any change, you are being given a buffer of two years to bring it back into the same proportion. With respect to capital, we also have something called as Basel III norms. Right. For that, what all things are needed? First is the capital adequacy ratio. Now, capital adequacy ratio, of course, is very important with the and uh, is also being forced to uh, provide for NPAs, right? What is the capital adequacy ratio? The minimum capital that you have to maintain in comparison of your risk-weighted assets. Indian commercial banks have been instructed to comply with Basel III recommendations. So I told you about Basel III recommendations. We had Basel I, Basel II, and then Basel III. Now, in Basel III recommendations, <clears throat> you have to be compliant. A minimum total capital of 9% of your total risk weighted assets. But apart from that, you must also maintain buffer when you have good period. That means if um, you have, uh, when, when you have a better uh, capital quality, then you must maintain buffer to deal with the times when you have stressed assets more. Right. So that is something which must be kept in mind. You cannot pay dividend unless your capitalized expenses have been written off. This is the main thing. The other things are not there. Right. This is not there. What is important is until your capitalized expenses are being paid off, even if depreciation or other things are not paid off, you can still pay dividend unless you cap your capitalized expenses are written off. That means preliminary expenses, commission on issue of shares, brokerage and all that. Then you have to transfer at least 20% of net profit each year to reserve fund. Scheduled commercial banks, 25%. Certain restrictions. Banking companies cannot invest in other companies so as to acquire a controlling interest. That means you cannot make someone else your subsidiary. Only if it is necessary and you take RBI's approval, then only you can form someone as your subsidiary. Otherwise, it is not allowed. Okay. Moreover, restriction on loans to the director or to the firm in which director is interested or to some guarantor of director, it is not allowed. Moreover, we have other restrictions that RBI can give directions on certain matters that for what purpose you can give advance. The margin that you might have to maintain, the rate of interest that you charge or the maximum amount that you can give, right? Then we have something called as license of banking companies. Any banking company which operates has to obtain a license before it can run a banking business. How do you obtain, apply for license? You have to make an application to RBI. Now, RBI will inspect certain things. What 
Is the company in a position to pay its claims? Are their fears not detrimental? And is it in the public interest that we give license? If these conditions are being satisfied, then RBI will grant license. But again, this license may be cancelled. When can it be cancelled? If you do not do banking business, you, are, you cease to carry on banking business, or you do not comply with the conditions, then in such a situation, your license will be cancelled. If you are dissatisfied with the decision of RBI, you have 30 days to make an appeal to central government. Apart from this, RBI also has a lot of other powers. RBI has the power to control your opening of new business. So if you want to open a new branch, you have to seek RBI's approval. If it is temporary within the same city, it is allowed. If you want to, uh, sorry, RBI also has the power to publish information, to give you directions, to remove managerial person if needed, to appoint more directors or to suspend the board as and when needed. Apart from that, there are various information that you have to furnish to RBI, which are covered in different, different sections. So I have compiled all of that. Banking companies have to prepare their financials according to third schedule given in the Banking Regulation Act. Although it is a banking company, but it is not required to comply with the format given in Companies Act. The balance sheet payable for every account in your and which is going to be duly audited. And auditor is also required to make additional report on certain matters which are specified in section number 30. That is going to be submitted to RBI. Apart from that, there is various other information in the form of different different returns also required to be reported to RBI. Like assets and liabilities on last Friday every month, unoperated accounts for 10 years within 30 days and mm, Profit and loss account balance sheet audit report that I already told you. Right. RBI is also entrusted with the white powers of inspection. Now we come to suspension of business. We are trying to suspend business. That means nobody is suspending. The banking company itself wants a period of moratorium. That means it wants that no claims and no litigations should be filed against me because I'm unable to discharge my obligations. So if a banking company cannot repay debts, cannot pay or cannot make payments as and when demanded and meet its obligations, it first of all discusses with RBI. RBI makes a report on the basis of that report along with an application we apply to High Court. And High Court gives us a stay for maximum six months. That is known as a period of moratorium. When there will be no action taken against the banking company, it will be given certain tenure to revive. Right? Then we have winding up of banking companies. A banking company cannot be wound up voluntarily. Okay, so it is not allowed unless you have RBI's approval. So unless RBI certifies that you will be able to pay every penny, every debt in full, then only voluntarily a banking company can shut its business or operations. Otherwise, uh, by RBI, it can be done on what grounds if you do not have the license, that means you're disentitled. If you're prohibited to receive deposits, when you cannot receive deposits, you cannot carry on the business of banking. If some compromise has been sanctioned and pursuant to that compromise it is happening, if you are unable to pay debts or in any way your continuance is prejudicial or harmful for the depositors, then in these situations, winding up may happen. And uh, one more thing we have that is about amalgamation of banking companies, which is um, allowed in two-way approval, shareholders, two-third majority voting and RBI's approval. So once you get these two approval and the scheme of amalgamation is sanctioned, banks may be merged into one another, right? And there after assets and everything will be transferred, right? Okay, let's now revise the chapter of surface C. Now this particular chapter, if we see the full form securitization and reconstruction of financial asset and enforcement of security interest. So the name itself involves the three most important elements contained in the chapter, securitization, asset reconstruction and enforcement of security interest. This act gives the power 
to banks if <coughs> they lend money to someone and they default in repayment right in such a situation how can banks recover their money of course they have ibc as a financial creditor they can make application under ibc subject to fulfillment of other conditions but they also have some right under surface act so banks if they want to recover their uh, non performing assets the loans that they have granted were not repaying they have been recognized as substandard loss or doubtful asset or they are fall in the npa category to recover that one very important right that banks have been conferred upon under this act is enforcement of security interest given under section number 13 what is enforcement of security interest it is like whatever security bank has that secured asset can be sold and your money can be realized towards payment of your dues right other two things securitization and asset reconstruction ideally banks have npa but it is very tedious job and very difficult for the banks to recover the same because banks have a lot of other functions to discharge so this act incorporates establishes a new type of company which is asset reconstruction company ideally it is a type of financial institution not a bank but regulated by rbi and registered also under rbi so this company helps the banks to recover npas how it helps we have methods of asset reconstruction that means the loan through asset reconstruction company can be reconstructed maybe their payment can be rescheduled maybe the if the company if the borrower the one who has taken loan that is the company who has borrowed loan maybe they are not performing well because of the management and that's why the creditors are suffering so management can be taken over and the payment can be realized by the asset reconstruction company we also have something called as securitization where what happens on the basis of that secured asset the security that has been given to banks on the basis of that asset reconstruction company raises money from qualified buyers by issuing them security receipts and from that money of course um that payment can be made to the banks or the secured creditors and eventually it can be recovered by the asset reconstruction company so these are the general meaning of the terms we also have other important definitions which of course you'll go through the first section that we read in this chapter is section number 3 which talks about registration of asset reconstruction company so any company which wants to do the business of asset reconstruction or securitization has to get itself registered they must have minimum net owned funds 100 crore that is prescribed and certificate of registration how do you get certificate of registration you have to give an application in the prescribed manner to rbi RBI will inspect your application and see whether the conditions are being complied with or not. What are the conditions? No loss in preceding three financial years. Adequate arrangement. How are you going to recover? How are you going to realize the financial assets that you will eventually buy? Adequate experience of the directors. No offence by directors involving moral turpitude. The sponsor should be fit. and proper we also have proper rbi gu guidelines gu uh, um, uh, to determine whether a person is fit or not who is a sponsor sponsor is someone who has more than equal to 10% equity in the company okay and compliance with prudential norms so if everything is satisfied certificate is granted by reserve bank but even if certificate is granted it can be cancelled under section number 4 however if the conditions are not complied with rbi will give an opportunity of being heard and reject the application if you become asset reconstruction company if you get that certificate 
then three things require prior approval of RBI. You substantial change in management, you change in registered office and you change in name. All these three require approval of RBI. Now, if you have got that certificate, but later on you cease to do that business or there is no investment of qualified buyer or you do not comply with some condition or direction, you don't maintain the books as you are supposed to, you don't produce the books for inspection or you change your name, registered office or management without approval of RBI, then in all these situations, your certificate may be cancelled. Of course, uh, opportunity uh, will be given to fulfill the conditions and um, if you are dissatisfied with the order, you can appeal to central government within 30 days. Right. Now, whenever asset reconstruction company want to acquire this right or interest in the financial asset, they can do so by making the payment or by issuing the debentures by entering into an agreement. What happens is the bank is transferring the financial asset in your name. That means all the legal formalities need to be done again. All the legal documents will be prepared again, which involves a lot of stamp duty. But here the stamp duty will be exempted. So if you are taking that financial asset for asset reconstruction or securitization, then no stamp duty. Apart from that, if you're taking, then of course there will be um, stamp duty. Right? Okay. Now, banks or financial institutions, how do they transfer financial in uh, interest? Once they transfer, they give a notice to the obligor. If they pay, great. If they do not pay, then they have to pay to asset reconstruction company or not to the bank because the asset has been transferred. Right? Very simple thing. Now, this is ideally securitization. After acquiring financial asset, ARC may offer security receipts to qualified buyers, raise funds, and they have to maintain separate accounts for every scheme. Whatever amount they realize from the loan, they have to utilize towards repaying the money that you have borrowed from qualified buyers. That is towards redemption of investments. If you do not do that, they can call a meeting and take adequate action. Then comes the section number nine, measures for asset reconstruction. So these are the methods by which asset may be reconstructed. Now you have to remember one thing, that asset reconstruction or taking these measures is not something which is very easy. RBI has made policies, regulations with respect to each one of them. Okay, so if you want to do that, we have to comply with all the conditions that have been imposed by RBI and thereafter we can do that. If we do not comply with the regulations or policies, then uh, application against us can be made to debt recovery tribunal. Okay, what are the asset, what are the measures of asset reconstruction? ARC, asset reconstruction company may take over the management, may sell some part, may lease some part, may reschedule the payment, may enforce their security interest as banks do on their own, may settle the dues at a lesser amount, may take possession of the secured asset or may convert your debt into equity. Right, so they can take some shares of the company and let go of your debt. So that can also happen. Now, they can also act as agent, they can also act as manager or receiver, but they can do so if they take approval from RBI. So there are other functions also of asset reconstruction company which may be undertaken. We have a very small section, section number 11, which talks about the resolution of disputes. Okay, so if uh, any dispute occurs, it is not going to be referred to any court, it will be taken through to arbitration okay now we have other sections where powers of rbi have been um, determined so rbi has the power to determine policy issue directions call for statement information audit inspection all these are uh, small small sections that we have now another important section section number 13 enforcement of security interest Okay, so banks have this right 
under the act they do not have to take any permission from court or tribunal so they do not intervene when you are enforcing the same when can you enforce the same when the borrower defaults now the default does not mean one non payment it means if you have classified them as npa or you have given them a notice and they have not made the payment within 90 days so then default happens so if you have defaulted you have adequately recognized them as npa then you can send a written notice to the borrower now the written notice will state this is the amount payable if you do not pay within 60 days we will enforce our security interest that means we will enforce any of the rights which have been conferred to us in section 13 subsection 4 there are four points given okay so if you do not pay this is going to happen this may happen right borrower pays great borrower doesn't pay this will happen borrower also has a right to raise representation or objection so if he raises it may be accepted by the bank or the lender it may be rejected if it is accepted then we'll work accordingly if it is rejected then you cannot go anywhere and appeal you have been communicated the reason for the same right so what are the consequences that are given in section 13 4 ma secured creditor can take possession of secured asset they can take over the management they can appoint a manager to manage the asset and one more point what they can do is supposedly borrower has a building borrower has mortgaged this building and took a loan they are unable to repay the loan so that building becomes the secured asset of the bank right now bank wants to enforce the security interest that means bank might take possession of the building that building is occupied by some people who pay lease rental to the borrower bank can give a notice to that um, lessee and instruct them that now you are not going to pay lease rental to them you are going to pay lease rental to so this can also happen this is also one of the methods which are given okay apart from that if uh, secured creditor is trying to sell an immovable property and you have a reserve price that means minimum price and no bidding takes place at a minimum price or over that price then secured creditor himself can also bid and take the property okay so that is something which can also happen now one important thing in section number 13 is that till that means before the date of publication of notice of public auction or inviting any quotation even before that if payment is made then the sale can stop then no sale will take place of the secured asset so if you pay even before um, uh, all that auction then also no action will be taken whatever action has been taken no further action will be taken right okay now we have section number 15 which tells us the manner of take over of management who takes over management there are two persons one the secured creditor when they want to enforce their security interest they can also take over the management secondly the asset reconstruction company when tries to reconstruct assets then they can take over the management in both these situations in both these situations what they are trying to do is they are trying to recover their loan for that they believe that management is acting in such a way which is not beneficial for the creditors hence we must intervene and we must manage the company in such a way that we are able to recover our dues so they will take over the management for only that tenure till they realize their debt in full after that the management will be restored okay so in such a situation what happens if the borrower is a company the credit secured creditor that is the bank or asset reconstruction company they take over the management they remove the directors all the directors existing directors will vacate office and they will appoint the directors as many as needed the directors who vacate the office will not be entitled for any compensation okay during this takeover time the powers of shareholders are also put on hold they cannot pass a resolution and appoint some director or they cannot pass an order of winding up unless they take approval from the secured creditor okay after that we have something called as appeals if uh, 
you are dissatisfied the borrower is not happy with the way uh, the takeover is happening or with the way the measures of asset reconstruction or anything is taking place if you are dissatisfied within 45 days you can appeal to debt recovery tribunal okay now debt recovery tribunal might think and believe that yes the secured creditor or maybe the asset reconstruction company is trying to exploit you they are not doing this measures according to the policy so they will ask to restore or maybe ask to uh, the secured creditor back to the borrower something like that or other order if you are still aggrieved or maybe the order is not passed in your favor or no order is passed in 4 months then within 30 days you can appeal to drat that is debt recovery appellate tribunal for that you have to deposit at least 50% of the amount due you may request the appellate tribunal and they can reduce this amount to 25% clear fine now the revision of pmla uh, now the very first section that we have to read in pmla is ideally section number 3 which talks about the offence of money laundering who is deemed to have committed an offence under money laundering so for that we first need to understand what do we mean by scheduled offense scheduled offense ideally is the offense which is specified in schedule 1 of the act which is divided into three parts part a part b and part c part a all offenses part b offenses uh, of value 1 crore or more and part c all offenses so these are the offenses which are specified in schedule 1 which are considered to be scheduled offense if you do any of this offense and you derive something out of that offense it could be your intangible asset it could be your tangible asset movable any money anything that is known as proceeds of crime now that proceeds of crime if you hold it if you try to conceal it if you try to possess it if you try to use it that is involvement in any activity relating to proceeds of crime and if you involve in any activity relating to proceeds of crime and you are trying to project it or use it as an untainted property then that is offense of money laundering even if you attempt to do so then also it is an offense if you indulge then of course it is if you assist someone it is if you are a party to that it is an offense whether directly or indirectly you are directly doing it or you are getting it done through someone in both the cases it will be an offense of money laundering now the process of money laundering ideally you can say money laundering is uh, an act through which black money is converted into white money of course black money can be obtained through different different sources like by evasion of taxes or by indulging yourself into some illegal activities the offense the money obtained from only those offenses which are specified in scheduled offense and conversion of it is money laundering so if i am a, a criminal and i'm trying to wash off my money that is actually money laundering there are various methods through which you can do money laundering like you can do smuggling of cash structuring then uh, entering into real estate transactions stock market scams bogus companies of course here we are not trying to teach you how to do money laundering this act is all about prevention of money laundering so the act hereby intends to prevent money laundering that is how people should not at all enter into this process of money laundering that is the main focus the two two authorities under the act are directorate of enforcement and um, uh, fiu that is financial intelligence unit of india okay now there are three stages of money laundering placement clearing integration placement is when you place the proceeds of crime into the system layering is to make it far away from the source and by entering into a series of transaction from here to here here to here here to here and integration is finally returning the money as if it was a legitimate source whenever anyone enters into this process of money laundering or attempts to do this money laundering he is deemed to have Uh, done committed an offence under money laundering, and when he do uh, does a, an offence of money laundering, he is liable for punishment. The punishment is given in section number four. Now, before we go on to section number four, we remember that schedule one is divided into three parts. Part A, paragraph two, the most important one, 
is relating to the offenses under narcotics drugs and psychotropic substances act which is very important for you to learn because if you indulge into the proceeds of crime of that particular act then you have a little serious punishment the punishment of offense of money laundering involves rigorous imprisonment and fine rigorous imprisonment minimum 3 years but the maximum differs in both cases if it is an offense of drugs then min maximum imprisonment 10 years but if it is other than that maximum imprisonment only 7 years okay so that is the only difference in both these type of punishments which you must remember and must learn okay now we have uh, different different uh, um, definitions and um, first let's talk about the reporting entities who are the reporting entities that is the first question reporting entities banking companies financial institutions intermediaries and uh, even i would say the persons who are designating certain types of business or profession who can be uh the persons who are dealers in precious metals real estate agents registrar and a casino and all that these are the places through which money laundering actually takes place because if i want to convert my black money into white money how do i convert this how do i enter into this financial system the choices that i have are these reporting entities only right that is the banking company financial institution intermediary and the person who are carrying on designated business or profession so through them only i can inject money into the system so obviously they will be exposed to the proceeds of crime they have to be cautious they have to maintain proper records and they have to do proper reporting so government has imposed an obligation on them only that you take care of all these things what you have to do is you have to maintain your record about the identity of your client and when the client ends the relationship with you that means i have closed the account despite that fact you will still maintain my record for next 5 years so after closure also you have to maintain account for 5 years you have to maintain the transactions record the transactions as may be prescribed so whatever high value transactions have been prescribed you have to maintain a separate record for that also and when the transaction takes place after 5 till 5 years you have to keep on maintaining that record after that you can discard and the same thing has to be reported also in such manner and time as prescribed reported to whom reported to the director of financial intelligence unit of india okay so it has to be reported to that whatever information you are obtaining from the client that has to be maintained as confidential apart from that we have some more sections we have section number 11a what is 11a verification verification of identity by the reporting entity supposedly i am a bank if anyone comes to me to open a bank account what i have to do i have to verify his identity how can i do that i can do aadhar online authentication other offline uh, verification then passport verification or any other document proof right so banks take that aadhar is not compulsory you have a choice you can provide any of this uh, document to verify your identity it is your choice the banks cannot compel you that you have to give aadhar only even if you don't have aadhar uh, very well the relationship can be established earlier government had authorized only the banks to do this online aadhar verification like if you go to a bank i hope you know that that online aadhar authentication can also be done now this has been also allowed for npci okay so national payments corporation of india are also permitted to do so uh, then we also have a section called as 12 aa 12 aa is about enhanced due diligence that means some more cautious of the specified transactions if a person comes and wants to deposit uh, or withdraw a huge chunk of cash why if you want to enter into any foreign exchange transaction exceeding a specific amount why uh, high value imports why or any uh, transaction which involves high risk why 
so in such cases you must verify the identity of clients verify the uh, their ownership verify the financial position verify to whom it is going right and um, if if the client fails to give you information about the same the, the same specified transaction will not take place and you have to maintain this information, maintain this record again for a period of five years. So we have three sections wherein uh, reporting entity has to verify something and maintain records. Section 11A, Section 12 and Section 12AA. These records have to be maintained. These records can be called by the director of enforcement anytime. And it is the duty of reporting entity that you must furnish information within the prescribed time and manner. Apart from this, some additional information also like cash transaction reports, suspicious transaction reports can also be asked. Whatever information the director obtains through this course has also be required to be maintained as confidential by the director himself. Now, the director has the power to impose fine. Before I tell you this section, I must recall the hierarchy. Director of rate of enforcement, adjudicating authority, appellate tribunal, um, special court, and then high court. That is how the hierarchy moves when we are talking about this particular act, right? So directorate of enforcement has director, it has additional director, joint director, deputy director, assistant director, other officers. So these are the hierarchy which they have. Now, supposedly the director himself um, thought so or it gets an application by some authority officer or person that this reporting entity is not fulfilling its obligation reporting entity is bank bank is not doing what it has to so director after inquiry can pass certain orders but during inquiry it sometimes happens that the accounts are all complex you are unable to identify what is going what is happening so in such a case the director can direct the reporting entity that this is a panel of chartered accountants maintained select one and get the audit done Right, we will bear the cost. So the audit will be done and the report will be in our hand. Now we can come to a conclusion that yes, they're, they're, they have complied with the obligations or non-compliance is there. If non-compliance is there, then we can issue further orders. And if the, the case is not so complex, the director himself may carry out the inquiry and come to a conclusion that yes, there is a failure to comply with the obligations. In such a case, there can be four directions, four orders which may be passed issuing of written warning, then giving a direction to comply with specific requirement, giving a direction to do some more reporting, sending uh, submission of some more reports and imposing some monetary penalties. Okay, whatever order is passed, the copy will be forwarded to the parties. Then we have section number five, which talks about the attachment of property. What do you mean by that? Till now, we were talking all the sections of reporting entities. Now, we are talking about the normal uh, situations, normal people who actually contravene uh, the provisions of money laundering. Supposedly, I have committed an offense and I have a land, which is my proceeds of crime. Someone comes to know that I have this. So, what will happen? The director, not below deputy director, if he has reasons to believe that, yes, whatever I have, is the proceeds of crime and if they don't take action then I might sell it I might uh, you know, try to conceal it I might try to transfer it so they can provisionally attach this land they can provisionally attach the property attachment means restricting my rights now I cannot transfer this land I cannot dispose of this land I can use it but I cannot uh, I don't have these rights against the land now, of course, for how long can they attach my property? For maximum 180 days. But as soon as they attach my property, within 30 days, they file a complaint to adjudicating authority and forward everything in a sealed envelope to them. Right. Now, adjudicating authority on receipt of this complaint, if they believe that, yes, this is an offense of money laundering, then they will send a show cause notice within uh, 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 for a, um, giving me a time of 30 days. What I have to do, what I'm asked, what are my sources of income? From where have I got this land? 
other relevant information and why my property should not be confiscated. So I have to give an adequate reply now, not to the director, but to this adjudicating authority, who is an adjudicating authority, uh, which is constituted by CG under the Act. Now, whatever reply I give, based on that reply, after hearing the parties, after hearing me, after hearing the director, and on the basis of all that relevant material, they will confirm the attachment. The attachment is confirmed. They haven't yet confiscated my property, although they will take into possession. But the actual confiscation, the order of confiscation can be passed only by the special court. So special court, uh, now it will be redirected to the special court where the actual trial will take place. And special court can either release the property and confiscate the property. If they confiscate the property, the property now belongs to central government. It will be free from all encumbrances. And if, if there is someone who is actually claiming to be uh, interested in the property, he has acted in good faith, he has generally suffered loss and he's not involved in money laundering, then central government can give the direction to give property to them. And otherwise, if it is discovered that the charge was created only to defeat the provisions of the act, then the charge will be declared as void and no one will have any right against the property. It is only the government which will have the right against the property. Right. After that, if you are dissatisfied, supposedly a director or um, the person uh, who is aggrieved by the order of adjudicating authority, or maybe director imposed fine on reporting authority and the reporting authority is aggrieved. So they all can make an appeal to Appellate Tribunal. Appellate Tribunal is as under the Smugglers Act. So Appellate Tribunal within 45 days, of course, extension can be given to you. Appellate Tribunal will have the same powers as are vested in a civil court while trying a suit. The decision is taken on majority. That means if there is a two bench, uh, two member bench and they do have different opinions, they will refer to the chairperson and thereafter uh, whatever he tells or if it is referred to some third party, whatever they tell that the decision will be taken ultimately by majority only. So appellate tribunal after hearing the parties, after giving an opportunity of being heard can confirm the order, set aside or modify the order. If you're still aggrieved, then you have a further chance of appeal under Section 42 of the Act to High Court. High Court can entertain appeals on both matters of question of law as well as question of fact. Within how many days, ma'am? Within 40, uh, 60 days plus an extended time period of 60 days. Right. Okay, so that is it about all the important uh, provisions. Okay, let's now revise the chapter of Insurance Act and thereafter is a insurance. What is insurance? It is basically spreading the risk over a large number of people, right? So ideally, the individual, whatever loss he might suffer, whatever risk he has, that is being spread over a number of people. How would it spread by entering into a contractual arrangement with a company of transferring risk? So we have two parties involved in this contract of insurance. One is the insured and other is the insurer. That is the insurance company. Insurance company provides the risk cover and the insured pays the premium against the same. Right. Till 1912, we did not have any insurance law and all the insurance companies were governed by uh, Companies Act only. But later on, undoubtedly, we uh, formed insurance law and uh, it was introduced. Now, today we have Insurance Act. Undoubtedly, we also have ADA. But apart from that, we also have LIC Act. We also have Marine Insurance Act. And we also have General Insurance Business Nationalization Act. So all these were also passed, which continues to stay. Now, uh, one more thing is very important that you have to... Keep this in mind, you can write it somewhere, FDI in insurance sector. Now, earlier FDI in insurance sector was allowed only up to 26% through automatic route. This has been enhanced to 49% under automatic route. We know that we can attract foreign 
people or foreign investments into different businesses that we Indian carry on. One of the business is insurance. Now, does government permit foreign people to intrude into this business? The answer is yes. We have two routes of FDI. One is automatic route and the other is approval route. Automatic route, that means you will not need, be needing the permissions and straight away by complying with all the requirements, you can enter and you can start with the business, right? Or you can invest. So under automatic route, earlier FDI was allowed only up to 26%. Now it is allowed up to 49%. We have different types of insurance. If I broadly classify, I can classify into three categories, life insurance, general insurance, and health insurance. Although health insurance is a part of general insurance, however, it has been differently classified because uh, it has been differently defined also. So we have a separate definition. General insurance includes the all other SA, general, fire, marine, miscellaneous, plant and machinery, all that insurance is general insurance, right? So insurance companies spread the risk among large number of people and to make small premiums as against the coverage. What can you insure? You can insure anything in which you have insurable interest, which goes as the first principle of insurance law. What is insurable interest? We have different types of interest. We have security interest. We have absolute interest. Likewise, we also have insurable interest. Insurable interest in any property means if damage happens to this property, I will suffer pecuniary or monetary or financial loss. If I don't suffer any loss, I don't have insurable interest in this property and I cannot get it insured. If I have a car and the car damages, I will suffer monetary loss. So I have insurable interest in that car. Even if I'm not the owner of the car, I have taken it on lease, then it um, brings my, I, I, I am a taxi driver, it brings me money. So I have an insurable interest in that, right? So it is important that you have an insurable interest in the property. Okay, now... The second thing comes to be good faith, utmost good faith. What is utmost good faith? Uh, you can remember the maxim, of course. It means basically honesty. Both the parties involved in this contract of insurance have to observe good faith and honesty over, uh, towards each other and make adequate and full disclosure of all the material things required. Whatever information you are exchanging that has to be true and correct. If it is incorrect or if you try to hide some material information, that means you have not acted in good faith and then the contract may be avoided. Then we come to representation. But before representation, um, misrepresentation, we have to understand what representation is. Representation is any statement which is made by one party to the, to the other. It may be implied, it may be expressed, whatever it is. Now, representation, if they are an integral part of the contract, that means if you say something which has, which is the basis of the contract, then that becomes a warranty. And if that is not complied with, then uh, the contract is avoided, right? But if it is not an integral part of the contract, not so material, then uh, we have to see, first thing, whether it was willful or it was... Uh, um, innocent. Secondly, what is the, uh, how much has it affected the contract, right? So then it can be avoided or then it can be turned out to be void. Please strike this because this will only create confusion to you. You have to remember that life insurance policies cannot be questioned after three years of commencement. See, if I have obtained any insurance, any insurance policy on providing incorrect information on the basis of fraud. Then, of course, whenever the fraud is discovered, that the contract can be avoided, right? But if it is a life insurance policy and I have obtained it on the basis of fraud also, then insurance companies have only three years to check this, to inspect this, to identify whether the other person is lying about something or etc. etc. and avoid the contract. If they cannot do that, after three years, it is not going to be questioned. Okay, after three years. So within three years of commencement of policy, you can question life insurance policy, not after that. Then comes your condition. Condition is something that you put on, uh, on the basis of which policy is granted. So some conditions are precedent, some conditions are subsequent. 
conditions precedent, if you don't fulfill this, if you don't pay the premium, if you don't do this, then of course the contract is void. Even if we have entered into a contract, it is not valid. And conditions subsequent that after this you have to do this. If you do not do that, then of course the contract will be avoided. Okay, so conditions are uh, general things. Then we have indemnity and subrogation. Indemnity is making good the loss. Life insurance, you can never make good the loss. If someone has died, you cannot never replace that person, right? So it is not a contract of indemnity. Others are a contract of indemnity. So you make good the loss. And subrogation, what do you mean by subrogation? Um, subrogation is ideally a right that allows someone else to make the payment. That means I have, uh, maybe I entered into any accident I and I am liable to this third party, but I'm not making the payment. It is the insurance company which is making the payment. So subrogation is the legal right that allows the insurance company to make the payment. Now, whenever I'm saying indemnification, Indemnification means I'm making good the loss of the other party. Supposedly, the other party has uh, taken a cargo insurance and the cargo is lost. The cargo is worth rupees 1 crore, but you have taken an insurance policy of only 10 lakhs. So, undoubtedly, your loss will not be made good. Right. So, it is subject to certain conditions. What uh, policy you have taken? And supposedly, you have taken a policy of 1 crore, but then your loss is only 10 lakhs. So, you will get only 10 lakhs. So these things have to be um, considered. Although we say that we put the insured in the same position as he was, but again, subject to these things. Then comes your proximate cause. Proximate cause means what? It is the nearest cause. Any mishap which occurs may be because of number of things or number of series which happens. Fire was caught. Fire was caught for certain reason. But then if in your insurance policy it is written that because of fire will give you the claim. So fire is the nearest cause and that, that's why you should get the claim. So we have to check the nearest cause and not the remote cause. Then comes your insurance and it, consumer protection. Consumer Protection Act covers insurance sectors as well. So we, the insured who have taken the insurance policy, whether we are taking it for our business or for our personal life, we are treated as consumers and we have the chance to move to consumer forum for any complaints. However, the insurance companies are not consumers. So if they have any complaint, they have the adequate forum as some civil courts. They cannot move to consumer forum. When do we consider our policy to start or commence? Whatever date is mentioned, what time, whatever time is mentioned. If date is not mentioned, it is governed by the provisions of Indian Contract Act and whenever the time of acceptance, it, uh, that is going to be the commencement. If time is not mentioned, we consider it midnight, right? Now we have some other provisions relating to insurance. Point number one. If we want to take insurance from some foreign insurer, not uh, allowed except with the permission of ADA. ADA is the authority which for which we have another act as well. Then comes your requirement as to capital, minimum paid of capital. In case of life insurance or general insurance, 100 CR, health insurance, 100 CR, reinsurance, 200 CR. And if I talk about reinsurance, we have another requirement that you cannot start or you cannot be registered unless you have 5,000 crores net owned funds. Because you are now going to protect the insurance company. That is what reinsurance business is all about, right? Every capital of insurance company will comprise of equity shares and uh, voting, share, uh, voting rights will be with the equity shareholders and the paid up amount will be same for all the shares. Now, insurance companies are also required to prepare their financials according to the format specified in the Act. So, they have to prepare balance sheet, p and revenue account and p and appropriation. Get it audited by the auditor who shall have the same powers, duties, liabilities, penalty as given under Companies Act, Chapter of Audit and Auditors. Right. Whatever audited account and statement they prepare, that is going to be printed and four copies furnished to the authority signed in the specified manner. Actuarial report is for life insurance business. 
But if you're carrying on life insurance business, once a year, you have to carry out the investigation and value your liabilities. So get your liabilities valued by an actuary, actually, and a report according to the regulations. You also have to prepare a record. Record of what? Record of all your policies. Policies, that means whatever you have issued, the names of policy holder, the date when the policy was affected, any uh, transfer, any nomination, everything, and the record of claims. Whoever has claimed, whatever claims have been granted, whatever claims have been rejected, if rejected, on what grounds? Okay, so every record has to be maintained how? It may be maintained in any form, including electronic form. However, if in the regulations you exceed the specified threshold, then it is going to be in the electronic form only. Right? Okay. Then we have investment of assets. So you have to keep your money invested. What amount invested? Liability minus whatever premium is due, whatever you are going to collect. That amount you have to keep invested in assets at all times. In what assets? 25% government securities, 25% in government or other approved securities and balance in other approved investments. If you are carrying on general insurance business, then 20% in government securities, 10% in government or other approved securities and balance according to the regulations. Fine? Okay. Then we have investigation and inspection authority, that is IRDA, may at any time direct person to be the investigating officer and investigate the affairs of insurer or intermediary. What do you mean by intermediary? Uh, intermediaries include the surveyors, loss assessors, and brokers, and everyone. We have three people involved in the chain, right? So we have the insurance company, we have the surveyors, law assessors and other people and we also have insurance agents who solicit and procure the insurance business, right? Okay, now the investigating officer will investigate. So it will be the duty of the insurance company or the insur intermediary to produce all the books, of accounts, registers, documents, everything and provide full assistance and cooperation to the investigating officer to let him carry out the investigation. Once he carries out the investigation, he will make the report to the authority. Any insurance company cannot pay any commission to any person other than insurance agents or the intermediaries. Okay, that means can the insurance companies appoint insurance agent? The answer is yes, you can appoint an insurance agent to procure business, but one person will not act as an agent for more than one insurer one life insurer, one general insurer, one health insurer, whatever. Okay. And uh, this I have already told you that no policy of life insurance is going to be called um, in question on any ground after three years, right? On any ground of misstatement after three years, within three years, it can be called, right? Okay. Moreover, the insurance agent or the intermediary cannot become the director of the insurance company. Then uh, one more thing. Dividing business is not allowed. That means you cannot say that if I collect a lot of premium, then you will get this much benefit. If I have to pay so much of claims, then you will not get this much benefit. Just like how it operates in case of mutual fund. If the market is high, then you'll get high returns. No, this is not going to happen. Undoubtedly, there can be a component of bonus which may be provided, but then it is not going to be strictly based on dividing business. Right. We have two councils, Life Insurance Council and General Insurance Council. Then we have surveyors or loss assessors who must possess the required qualification and they must be the member of Indian Institute of um, Insurance Surveyors and Loss Assessors. Okay. All the assets and liabilities are going to be valued for not more than market value. And every insurer or reinsurer at all times have to maintain assets. Um, over the amount of liabilities, that means your assets will always be more than liabilities and at least 50% of the minimum capital. If this is not complied, then you are deemed as insolvent. Right? Moving to the next part, that is ADA, Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority. Right? So we have this authority to safeguard policyholders and 
this is not just regulation this is also development so this also upgrades or this also develops the whole insurance sector central government establishes an authority which is going to be body corporate and uh, the head office will be determined by central government it will have a chairman maximum five time five full time members and maximum four part time members maximum age of chairman 65 years others 62 years they will be appointed for five years at once they can be reappointed if any member or chairperson want to resign by giving three months notice to central government they can resign they can also be removed from their office if they become insolvent or insane or convicted for offense involving moral turpitude or they um, act um, against public interest or acquire some financial interest which is not legal okay now when they leave this authority they have a bar on employment for two years so for two years they cannot be employed or appointed in central government state government or insurance sector the authority is going to meet and take decisions by voting the votes shall happen and in case there is a tie chairperson will have a casting vote so chairperson is the person who's actually responsible for the whole general superintendent and everything then we have a section section number 14 which prescribes wide powers of the authority so authority first thing whenever you want to open an insurance company you have to register with ERDA so that registration certificate is being granted it is being suspended it is being cancelled all done by ERDA right then you also specify the code for your service code of conduct how you have to behave then uh, specifying the qualifications for the agents intermediaries conducting a lot of investigations, regulating the tariff advisory committee. What is tariff advisory committee? The committee which is being uh, formed to prescribe and make norms for your minimum, maximum tariff and all that, the premiums that are being collected by the insurance company so that undue advantage is not taken uh, by the companies and the policyholders do not suffer. So uniform, to maintain that uniformity in the tariff or the premiums, right? So that is being uh, supervised and um, other regulating investment funds a fund which is being maintained settling disputes so all this is being done by the authority for this the authority also has a fund ADA of India fund so central government grants necessary funds for running this authority so it gets money from central government and other sources and it uses the money for payment of salary of the members and other legitimate expenses of the authority. It has to maintain all the books of accounts and annual financial statements which are going to be audited by CAG and also presented before parliament and central government. Right. Apart from that, central government has the power to issue directions to the authority if the authority is not performing well if uh, there is some fraud or they are constantly defaulting in the directions, then they can also be superseded by the government. So central government, maximum tenure of supersession, six months. So within six months, they can bring in new people and reform the authority. You also have to furnish a lot of returns or information to central government. All the members, chairperson, everyone is going to be the public servant and uh, um, insurance advisory committee will also be formed which is going to advise IRDA on certain matters and also on making regulations um, so that is that are some general part apart from this sections that we have read right okay in bankruptcy code 2016 first of all it involves two terms that is insolvency and bankruptcy <clears throat> what do we mean by these two terms and why at all code is used See, it has a, a wide application and it it includes a lot of content a lot of um, acts were repealed a lot of acts were amended okay and after that this particular one unified law has been made with respect to insolvency and bankruptcy okay so that's why the use of code instead of acts as it involves a lot of aspects in one unified law now what do we mean by these two terms, insolvency and bankruptcy, right? Because it is a code um, about the two terms involved over here. So, for 
to understand that insolvency is a state okay insolvency is a state we all know we have been as commerce students preparing balance sheet for uh, years right and every time we prepare balance sheet we know that we have certain set of assets and certain set of liabilities that is for any entity that we are making the financials of as in a normal common balance that for every for each one of us like if i talk about me as a person i might have certain assets and i also might have certain liabilities say for example i have a house and i have a bank loan okay so supposedly i bought a house at 2 crore rupees and my uh, loan is somewhere around 1 crore rupees now slowly what happened that the house price may be for certain reasons a decline and came up to 50 lakh i have no bank balance and I have to repay a loan of 1 crore still. That means my assets can realize only 50 lakh whereas I have to pay an amount of 1 crore to the bank. So my liabilities exceed my assets. So this is a state. This is a position where I am in right now. I am in a position where my liabilities are more whereas my assets are less. Right. So this is called as a state of insolvency. This may be for a company, for a non-company, for a partnership firm, for an individual, for any uh, entity, any person, right? So, this is applicable in everyone. Now, <clears throat> I know this particular state of mind. Nobody else knows it. Supposedly, I defaulted in the repayment of my loan to bank. I had to make uh, the payment of an EMI and I did not pay that. Now the bank knows that there is some issue why Shivangi is not paying our installments in time. So now the bank gets concerned and bank uh, uh, comes up to me. We have discussions like, 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 like things. Now instead of constant repetition, reminders, I am still not being able to repay bank loan because I don't have money. Right. So what bank can do now? What can bank do now? What can bank do now? Now bank can initiate some proceeding against me. So bank can go to some person and bank can say that Shivangi is not in a very well state. She is in a state of insolvency. What we should do is we should bring her out of this insolvency. How? Maybe there is some way, maybe her business is not going so well, so we can provide her uh, ways, we can talk to her creditors, like to provide some credit, etc, etc. And we can bring her out of that insolvency state so that she comes back in the normal position and repay my loan. And what if she cannot come out of that insolvency state? Then we should sell her house, whatever assets are available with her and whatever loan amount can be repaid, I want my money back because I cannot take further risk. So bank wants someone to listen to this situation. Earlier also there were rules, there were authorities, there were laws, but not so uniform and not so well defined. IBC has made this process absolutely clear and ease ease utmost ease has been provided uh, in this regard so one by one we will uh, try to uh, understand that okay so insolvency is a state is a position and now what happens is the person goes to some authority the person tries to resolve my insolvency if I, it cannot be resolved then the court will declare me as bankrupt and all my assets will be sold and my um, liabilities will be paid off because I am an individual. I am an individual. Right. I have a chart over here which is going to help us realize. Please mark my words and uh, keep this in mind. This is just a revision lecture. So I am not going to explain you every step by step. This is just an introduction. I am trying to give you the brief idea. Not of course in the most in-depth manner that I take up in the classes. Okay. So this is just a revision class and you are only going to get an overview of the same. So insolvency my dear is a state where your assets are lesser than your liabilities. If you go ahead and treat the state of insolvency, that means you can resolve this insolvency, nothing better than that. And this particular code attempts endeavors to do that only. 
liquidation is a very trivial or a very small part of this particular code because its emphasis is to revive the person from the state of insolvency okay so insolvency if it is treated nothing better than that if it is untreated then if you leave it like that or it cannot be treated for some reason then it may lead to bankruptcy for non corporates that i spoke to you about and for liquidation for corporate now what do we mean by liquidation insolvency is a separate term bankruptcy is a separate term and what do you mean by liquidation these three terms are separate different terms liquidation is nothing but the process of winding up and what is winding up see winding up liquidation dissolution again so many terms so dissolution and liquidation are different terms liquidation means winding up and what is winding up winding up means sale of assets to pay of liabilities only that particular process is now when you want to remove the existence of the company the company was incorporated then there is a register of companies in which the name of company is mentioned that means company has a separate legal entity company has its own existence we dissolve that existence pursuant to liquidation clear i hope you have got this basic idea now listen to me very carefully listen to me very carefully uh, let's uh, take an example let's take an example before uh, i make you understand anything else there is a company a company means a corporate of course i hope you all know what is corporate and what is non corporate right so corporate uh, llp company they all will come under corporates only so there is a company that is a corporate the company has taken a loan from a bank the company has taken a loan from a bank now supposedly the company defaults in payment in repayment of this loan company defaults in repayment of this loan this bank will realize that there is something wrong so bank can move an application to the appropriate authority and appropriate authority will initiate the insolvency resolution process that means they will try to resolve the state of insolvency of the company if that cannot be done if that cannot be done then the re re relevant authority will pass the order of liquidation that means they will say that sell off all the assets of the company and pay off its liabilities so wind up this company the company cannot no more function uh, cannot function anymore wind up this company and dissolve its name you get my point you get my point so first endeavor is to resolve the state of insolvency that cannot be done then liquidation we have two set of people in this particular code one is corporates and other is individuals partnership firms and like right so we have to read about corporates only so we are reading we will read corporate insolvency resolution process corporate insolvency resolution process for which we need to know three basic terms corporate debtor financial creditor and operational creditor company or llp whatever the case may be this is a corporate and it's a corporate debtor because it has taken some money if it has taken a loan from a bank that means bank has held in its finances the bank has helped the company in its finances so of course it is a financial creditor if a person has supplied goods to the company and the company is unable to make payment for that company has taken some goods on credit the company is unable to make payment for that the person has helped in the company's operations it is an operational credit if the company is unable to re, unable to pay the salary of employees employees are operational creditor or financial creditor 
we will be considered as operational creditor why because they have helped in the operations of the company okay if supposedly company has taken loan from some employee now that employee has helped in the finances of the company so that employee in that particular capacity will be treated as financial you get my point right you should know all these we are just revising so these are basic parties that you must have an idea of okay now now, if we talk about uh, this particular code, it has repealed two acts and amended many laws. It came into force on 28 May 2016. If you talk about it, it was introduced in December 2015 in Lok Sabha, then of course in May 2016 in Rajya Sabha. It was first passed in Lok Sabha, then passed in Rajya Sabha. It got assent on 28 May 2016 and was notified on the same day. On the same day. Now, under this particular code, we have an authority or you can say we have a board which is Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. It is IBBI which is commonly known as board. So throughout the act, wherever board is written, it does not mean your board of directors of a company. It means IBBI. Clear? Now, this IBBI, who has established IBBI? Central government has established IBBI to oversee uh, the whole proceedings of I proceedings under IBC. So, it is the authority which is governing everything under IBC. Okay, that means, ma'am, if supposedly a company has taken loan from a bank and the company is unable to repay the loan, the bank is going to move to IBBI and make an application. No, my dear. Under IBBI also we have authorities. We have read about National Company Law Tribunal under Companies Act, NCLP. That is going to be the adjudicating authority for the corporates under IBC. For the corporates under IBC, that is relevant for you. That is something that you must know. IBBI, of course, is a board which is going to oversee the whole thing. Its head office is at uh, New Delhi. But that is not the adjudicating authority. That is the supreme authority, you can say. Okay. So, adjudicating authority is NCLT. So, I might say NCLT, I might say adjudicating authority, whatever I am saying, they both mean the same for corporates under IBC. Okay. Now, this particular code is uh, divided into five parts. It has 12 schedules and uh, of course, all the chapters are divided, all the parts are divided into different, different sections. What is relevant for us? Listen to me very carefully. Part 2. Part 2 is for corporates. So, part 2 talks about treating the insolvency state of corporates and if it cannot be treated, then going for liquidation. That is what is covered under part 2 of the code. Okay. So, part 2 has its own definitions also. It has the whole process. CIRP stands for Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process, Liquidation, Fast Track CIRP, Voluntary Liquidation. That means there is no, um, um, no one who has made an application. The corporate debtor himself wants to liquidate on certain grounds. So, they can go for voluntary liquidation. Then uh, about um, adjudicating authority of fences and penalties. So, all this is covered under part 2. All this is covered under part 2. Clear? Part 1 is preliminary which tells us about the title, application and certain definition. Now the definitions which are given under part 2 apply to the whole IBC. But the definitions which are given under part 2 will apply to only part 2. This is very obvious. I hope you all know that. Right? Okay. So, these are the basic um, structure you can say. One important thing, one important thing, the provisions for uh, 
uh, insolvency and liquidation of corporate debtors shall apply only when the minimum amount of default is 1 lakh. The, uh, the government can go up and prescribe this amount up to 1 crore and the government has actually prescribed the amount to 1 crore. So, so supposedly company has taken company has taken a loan of 20 lakh rupees and company has not repaid that loan can bank go and make an application under this code for recovery of money no the minimum default amount has to be 1 crore the minimum default amount has to be 1 crore only then otherwise the ibc will be flooded with applications Right, and it will be very difficult for them to manage the same. Right, so uh, the amount earlier it was 1 lakh only. So 1 lakh what the uh, authorities realized that they have a lot of applications flowing. So it, it became difficult for them to manage. So now the amount has been increased to 1 crore. So, now let's talk about uh, uh, the whole overview of CIRP. A basic structure idea we'll get. And then we will start one by one. So basic thing is commitment of default and that too minimum amount default has to be 1 crore. If there is existence of default then application may be filed with adjudicating authority. Who is the adjudicating authority? NCLT for corporates. So either our financial creditor can go and file the application or the operational creditor can go and file the application or the company itself. That is the corporate debtor itself can go and file the application. So any of them can file an application with adjudicating authority that we want to resolve the state of insolvency. See we cannot in, uh, directly go for liquidation because attempt will be not to suppress the business houses. The attempt will be to revive the business houses if at all they cannot be revived then to liquidate them. Right. So existence of default uh, at least uh, compliance with the minimum amount of default and application with adjudicating authority now what happens there has to be someone who is going to undertake the whole process of revival who is going to try and resolve the state of insolvency that person is selected from a panel of professionals who are qualified uh, and registered of course so one such person will be selected from the list of insolvency professionals insolvency professionals out of that one person will be selected and that person if he gives his consent just like we appoint auditors we have um, uh, so many members so many chartered accountants who are in practice who are eligible to carry out the audit so we select one ca in practice if he gives us consent that okay i'm ready to do your uh, take up your audit work uh, or assignment so we appoint that person as an auditor likewise the same is going to happen here also okay who does it who doesn't i'm going to tell you everything so in the same manner out of that list of person who are eligible who are qualified who are registered that list of uh, ips from that one person will be selected he will be appointed as interim resolution professional for the time being not the final one but for the time being then what happens is uh, a committee of creditors is formed a committee of creditors because if i'm talking about resolving the state of insolvency of a company who are the persons I have to take care of? Of course, the creditor. Because company has to make payment to the creditors. Supposedly, there is a bank who has to take 2 crore from this company. And I, as some resolution professional, I am a professional who is going to resolve everything. I come and I say that bank, I am going to pay you 50 paise in a rupee. The bank might get upset the bank might not be happy with the decision so do you think banks should have a say in the decisions that i make because it is the 
ultimate who is the ultimate beneficiary it is the creditors so creditors must be involved in this decision making about how you are going to treat the insolvency of a company right so so for that matter a committee of creditors is being formed and they appoint the final resolution professional after that uh, who prepares information memorandum then they invite plans from prospective resolution uh, applicant that how the state of insolvency can be resolved the plan is submitted to committee of creditors do you agree do you disagree if you agree then we will submit the same plan to adjudicating authority and if adjudicating authority also agrees then we will implement the plan and we will resolve the state of insolvency if you don't agree then we don't have a choice or if you agree and we submit the plan to adjudicating authority and adjudicating authority doesn't exist we don't have a choice so in that situation we will go for liquidation of the company because ultimately if anyone has made an application under this um, ibc code he must get some uh, resolution he must get some relief that is important right so these are some short forms that have been used in the charts and they might help you okay so now we begin with the actual thing with the actual thing why this particular code has been um, or why this particular framework has been uh, made is to handle the conflicts between the creditors and the debtors in a more efficient manner because earlier also you had disputes there were court cases one company has millions of court cases running um not millions it's it's too high hundreds of court cases maybe um against them now it, it becomes difficult for the judicial systems to handle as well as for the company to handle so here what happens is somebody has initiated cirp it's going to serve all the creditors so it becomes better for them right uh, it it prevents a lot of business failure because ultimately if this situation is not resolved the company will run into liquidation so if attempt can be made to resolve and uh, revive the business nothing better than that right so of course the code helps in a lot of manner and um, wherever an enterprise defaults the control of the enterprise is not going to stay with them it is going to shift to basically the committee of creditors who assess all the proposals and everything who assess the proposals and everything and try to revive the enterprise if it cannot be revived they are going to take it for liquidation okay so my dear we begin with our code we begin with our code it is applicable to all the entities that is the company which is registered under companies act llp then any other body corporate even the guarantors to the corporate debtors right partnership firms proprietorship firms individuals also i to um, spoke about right but we have to read about the corporates which is given under part 2 we have some important definitions which uh, i'm not going to discuss in this uh, revision class but i have told you the basic meaning of the terms as and when needed i have already told you about the financial creditor operational creditor insolvency professional the person who is <coughs> enrolled as a professional okay so let's begin our cirp let's begin our CIR. The first step is filing of an application. Of course, after the existence or commit uh, uh, or commission of default, after that only application is going to be made. So, if the corporate debtor has defaulted in repayment, in payment owed to applicant or owed to any other financial creditor. that means maybe company has taken loan from a bank and company has also taken loan from other people the company has repaid this loan has not repaid that loan so collectively if it has not it if it has defaulted in the payment of amount to any financial creditor then this application can be made either by itself 
or jointly with other financial creditors. The one uh, amazing thing I would say which has been established under IBBI uh, or you can say under this particular code is information utility. Information utility under IBC earlier there wasn't any information utility. Now we have India's first um, information utility which is NESL. Okay. It is registered under IBBI. If you want to check out, you can check out its website. I was trying to uh, quote that exact website for you. Yes, it is nesl.co.in. Okay, so if you want, you can check it. National League Governance Services Limited. You will get that information utility. Now, what is information utility? Of course, it has some information which is stored. It has some information which is stored. See, if... Um, you talk about income tax portal whenever you have AIS I hope you all know about AIS annual information system just like we had 26 AS when we were filing returns previously we now also have AIS AIS is what it is doing it is tracing all the information from all the available sources and presenting it at one place right in the same manner information utility is nothing but it stores information from different sources and brings it at one place right so a lot of people register their um, uh, the banks are going to provide information and that information is going to be stored so financial creditors definitely have this information under iu that is information utility so, if, um, let me say, let me uh, try to explain you with an example. Supposedly, I tell you that um, my TDS for financial year 2021 has been deducted, has been deducted at 20,000. The amount deducted as TDS is 20,000. Will you believe me? Well, the answer is, you might believe me, you might not believe me. But if I present to you a copy of 26 AS where in financial year 2021 is clearly mentioned and the TDS deducted comes out to be 20,000, you will definitely believe me. Why? Because it is an extract which has been made available from a government source. Likewise, if a financial creditor makes an application to IBBI stating that somebody has defaulted in repayment, the adjudicating authority might not believe it, but if they attach that extract from information utility, they have to believe it, right? So, they file an application along with the record of default. They suggest the name of resolution professional. So, out of that list, they can select one resolution professional and... Um, any other information which is specified by board board here means IBBI okay so they file an application to adjudicating authority what adjudicating authority is going to do is within 14 days they are going to either admit the application if they are satisfied that yes there is default the application is complete and the name of IP that they have suggested to act as RP is Clean. That means there is no disciplinary proceeding which is pending against that particular person. There is no proceeding which is carrying out, right? So he has not uh, been involved in any such thing, right? So if they are satisfied, they are going to admit the application and the date of admission of application is going to be treated as the commencement of CIRP, right? So this can be an objective question asked to you. What is the commencement of CIRP? Now, Adjudicating authority can also reject application. When can it reject application? If it is satisfied that the default is not there or the application is incomplete or there is some disciplinary proceeding which is pending against the proposed RP. So they will give a notice to the applicant to rectify the defect within seven days and if rectified, then the application will again be admitted. If the application is admitted within seven days, it is going to be communicated to the financial creditor as well as the corporate debtor. Corporate debtor might not even know that such application has been admitted by financial creditor. Right? If it is rejected, then you don't need to intimate to corporate debtor. Right? Financial creditor made an application. 
directly you uh, you have rejected it you intimate to direct uh, financial creditor but if you admit the application now the process of insolvency is going to start so you have to tell that company you have to tell that corporate debtor that now we are going to start the insolvency resolution of your company so you must inform them over here your information to them is not required and if no order is passed within 14 days you have to record reasons in writing for the same that why is there a delay why is there a delay so, right so shall we move further okay now this was about financial creditor see uh, the important section numbers to remember financial creditor can initiate cirp under section 7 operational creditor can initiate cirp under section 9 however section 8 and section 9 both are for operational creditor we are going to read them now and corporate debtor himself can initiate cirp under section 10 okay so these are three uh, uh, three you can say important sections and then we have under section 11 certain persons who are not entitled to make an application for cirp that means in certain cases you cannot go for CIRP. Okay, so about financial creditor we have already read. Now we are going to read about the operational creditor. Now operational creditor record will not be there in information utility. And I have taken some, I am a company. I have taken some goods from a supplier, from a vendor. I have not repaid their amount. In these operational transactions, there can be existence of dispute a lot of times. I have, I wanted certain goods, you provided the goods of a lower quality, so I have not made your payment. You are not ready to take back the goods, you have provided me defective goods. You have provided me delayed goods for which um, I suffered losses. So a lot of problems can exist in such type of cases. And that's why it may be delay in the payment. So supposedly the vendor gave me goods which are not up to the mark or of the quality that I agreed to. And that's why I'm not making payment. So the operational creditor goes to the adjudicating authority and tells that he's not making my payment. You initiate CIRP against him. It will be a waste of time. It will be a waste of time because it's not so that I'm not ready to make the payment. That I'm not making payment because there is existence of dispute. Right. So in such situation, the, the case is slightly different. What happens is the code requires operational creditor to send a notice, uh, a demand notice plus the invoice. Demanding payment from the corporate debtor and corporate debtor within 10 days has to either pay the amount or intimate about dispute has to do either of the two things. If it does not do any of the things, then application for initiating CIRP can be fine. If there is a dispute which is in existence, the dispute has to be resolved. Payment, uh, you cannot initiate CIRP over here, right? If the person has already made payment, you cannot initiate CIRP. If the person is not doing any of these, then you can initiate CIRP and uh, you can file an application. You will attach the copy of invoice, demand notice, affidavit that there is no dispute, proposed IRP here. It is not mandatory to propose the name of IRP. See, financial creditors know about IRP, they are in touch of IRP, but a vendor, we cannot expect him to propose some IRP or knows the name of any IRP. So, here it is optional. You may propose, if you don't propose, the board, the IBBI. IBBI is going to appoint one for you. Record with IU, if available, certificate from financial institution that the debt is not, that is your bank, bank records other proof for any prescribed information so you file an application for initiating cirp against corporate debtor and within 14 days if the adjudicating authority is satisfied 
that the application is complete you gave the demand notice these are prerequisites under section 8 you read about the prerequisites that means an operational creditor has to satisfy these things only then he can make an application under section 9 for CIRP against the corporate debt so if adjudicating authority is satisfied that yes demand notice has been given to corporate debtor because that is a prerequisite which is given under section 8 so it has to be given first and uh, what will be the effect of the demand notice that either the debt will be paid or the uh, dispute will be given or none of that happens right so if debt is not paid then only you can make an application and there should be no dispute of notice so if AA that is NCLT is satisfied of that and of course the proceedings if any proposed IRP is there there should be no pending proceedings against him only then the application will be admitted and the date of admission of application is the date of commencement of CIRP. However, if NCLT thinks that maybe application is not complete or maybe you have not complied with the prerequisite under section 8 that means you have not served the demand notice to corporate debtor or if you have served the demand notice maybe the debt has already been paid off or there is some notice of dispute which has been received or there are some pending disciplinary proceedings against the proposed IRP in that case in that case NCLT will provide an opportunity to rectify the default within seven days and if rectified application will be admitted if not rectified the application will be rejected clear now comes section number 10 initiation of CIRP by corporate applicant the corporate applicant himself can also make an application for CIRP supposedly thinks that maybe if we don't treat our insolvency now we might run into liquidation or we might incur some heavy losses so it's better to revive our situation and that a professional can do certainly better so we want some professional to take over the management and try to resolve with a beautiful resolution plan so corporate debtor himself makes an application to adjudicating authority the same thing happens within 14 days if the adjudicating authority is satisfied that whatever name of IRP you have proposed there is no pending proceedings against that person the application will be admitted if there are pending proceedings you will be given an opportunity to rectify the default or defect within seven days and resubmit your application if rectified application will be admitted if not application will be rejected clear okay once you have made an application under section 7 9 or 10 7 by financial creditor 9 by operational creditor and 10 by corporate debtor himself corporate applicant if you have made an application can that application be which see if you make an application and the application is not yet accepted by the adjudicating authority so you give the permission no i want to take back my uh, you uh, request for the permission i want to take back my application you can if it has already been accepted that means somehow the proceedings have moved to a next stage quite possible till now you have not constituted that committee of creditors so you don't need their approval only IRP can make an application and do it if you have constituted COC or thereafter you have invited plans or all then you require approval from COC of at least 90 percent okay so then uh, once you obtain the approval within three days you will make an application to adjudicating authority and adjudicating authority is going to pass an order for approval that yes you may withdraw your application so this can be a question which may be asked to you that whether uh, an application once submitted for CIRP can be withdrawn or it cannot be withdrawn right so it can be withdrawn there are certain cases where an application cannot be made for CIRP which is given in the section number 11. See, some corporate debt is already undergoing CIRP, some operational creditor again wants to make an application. Are Baba, the CIRP process is already going against that corporate debtor. So, how another application that will be multiplicity, na? 
how can we initiate CIRP against one corporate debtor um, by two different people? No, no, no. So that is not allowed. If supposedly CIRP was completed six months before only, and again you want to initiate CIRP, no, 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 that is not possible. So give it some time, right? So if it was completed within preceding 12 months, if, if there was some CIRP plan which was approved, but the company could not implement and execute the same and violated it within preceding 12 months, then again you cannot initiate CIRP. And lastly, if already liquidation order is being passed for the corporate data, so you cannot initiate CIRP. Right. So, my dear, what is the flow? Application is being filed by either financial creditor, operational creditor or the corporate debtor himself. Once an application is filed, it is either admitted or rejected. If it is admitted, if it is admitted, that comes out to be the admission or that comes out to be the commencement date. And from that commencement date, within 180 days, CIRP has to be completed. CIRP has to be completed. A one-time extension of 90 days may be granted subject to approval. So, uh, COC is going to um, buy 66% um, vote, uh, votes in value. They are going to approve that yes, we want extension. Then RP will apply for extension to adjudicating authority and adjudicating authority will grant an extension. But that extension cannot be granted more than once and that took 90 days only. Third, now, once your application is admitted, it marks the date of initiation of CIRP and that has to be completed within 180 days. As soon as the application is admitted, there are three things which happen. Firstly, declaration of moratorium. Secondly, appointment of IRP. And thirdly, public announcement. What do we mean by moratorium? Moratorium means suspension of certain things. Supposedly, I am trying to resolve certain things and at the same time more issues are popping up. It will be difficult to resolve. Likewise, if, if I am trying to settle down the disputes between the creditors and the debtors but some creditors are again filing cases against these people, it will be difficult, it will be impossible to resolve. So, that is suspension of these things which is moratorium covered under section 14 which tells us that on insolvency commencement date, AA that is adjudicating authority or NCLT is going to prohibit that no new suit is going to be filed, no old suit is going to be continued for hearing during moratorium. So, these all things or activities are going to be suspended. You cannot transfer any asset, you cannot dispose of any asset, you cannot create any new charge on that assets, you cannot let someone else recover the property which is in your possession at right now. Supposedly, the company is functioning in a building. That building is taken on lease from someone else. So, he cannot take back the property uh, right now which is in possession of corporate data. Of course, if lease has expired, uh, other terms are uh, prevalent, right? So, that cannot be recovered during moratorium. You cannot execute any order of court and you cannot even uh, enforce the action under Surface Act. But, 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 there are two things which will not be affected. One is supply of essential goods and services. So, like electricity and all. So, supply of essential goods and services will not be affected. And if the company had a telecom license, that license will not be revoked. Because if that license is revoked, the company will not be able to function anymore. Right? And when the company is not able to function anymore, how will the uh, insolvency be revived? Right? So, that will be, uh, become difficult. So, the license will not be revoked or suspended and the supply of essential goods will not be terminated. Moratorium comes to the end once CIRP comes to the end. So, during whole process of CIRP, there will be moratorium. Supposedly, CIRP could not happen properly and the company had to turn into liquidation. So, when it starts the liquidation, then also moratorium will come to end. 
clear so what is happening applications are being filed application is admitted then moratorium is declared then irp will be appointed and after irp is appointed within 3 days irp will make a public announcement so first of all i'm going to deal with irp who do you think should be appointed as irp when applications for cirp were filed by financial creditor or the corporate debtor they proposed a name and when the application was filed by operational creditor they also could propose a name it was not mandatory for them to propose a name but they can propose a name right so if they had proposed the name and no disciplinary proceeding is pending against that person he will be appointed as irp supposedly operational creditor files an application and does not propose any name then the matter will be referred to the ibbi to ibbi and ibbi within 10 days will suggest a name who will be appointed as irp right so uh, likewise the appointment of irp is going to take place once irp is appointed within 3 days he sorry how it's clear right so within 3 days he is going to appoint uh, he is going to make a public announcement what will be written in public announcement in public announcement he is going to invite the claims he is going to tell about the corporate debtor that what is the name what is the address under which authority is this registered i am the irp what is the last date by when you can submit the claims if you submit a false claim there will be a penalty and by when cirp will end okay so so he makes a public announcement with respect to that now irp is appointed he has certain powers and he also has certain duties what type of powers he is going to take all the powers of board he is going to supersede the board all the officers all the employees will now report to irp so he is going to take over the whole management of corporate debtor he can execute deeds and documents he can sign he can take actions he will be have access to all the books of accounts to all the records all the of course he has to comply with law right and protect all the property of the company at the same time he also has certain duties what are the duties he has to collect information about the asset and as i told you when he makes a public announcement he is making public announcement for invitation of claims so he also collects and collate all the claims he verifies all the claims the most important function is to constitute the committee of creditors see irp has a very short tenure from the insolvency commencement date till the appointment of rp he might be appointed as rp also and somebody else can also be appointed as rp so in the capacity of irp he has a very short tenure in that tenure he has to perform these duties he has to take care of the assets he has to file the information with the utility so that it's updated he has to monitor the assets and he has to perform the duties as specified manner of submission of claims not so important but you can remember the forms that if you are a financial creditor you have submit in form c if operational creditor submit in form b and the employees and workmen have to submit in form d right so they submit all the claims irp verifies the claims makes a report and provides it to adjudicating authority right now application is filed application is admitted moratorium is declared IRP is appointed public announcement is made then claims are collected and committee of creditors is formed committee of creditors my dear under section number 21 so after collation of claims before collation of claims you cannot uh, actually I um, constitute a committee of creditors why because you need to know who are the financial creditors in the committee of creditors we have financial creditors we don't have operational creditors okay uh, but if supposedly there are no financial creditors then we might have to include operational creditors only now listen to me 
uh, if if you have these doubts that ma'am their interest will be hampered no such their interest will be hampered i'm telling you if financial creditors exist then all the financial creditors will be the part of that committee of creditors but if there are any re related party they will not have a right to say they will not have a right to vote okay if all the financial creditors are related party then then operational creditors will be the part of committee of credit and if there is no financial creditor then also operational creditors will be the part of financial uh, part of committee of creditors in both these situation the 18 largest operational creditors by value one representative of workman and one representative of employee they are going to be they are going to be the financial creditors supposedly we don't have 18 operational creditors we only have 10 operational creditors then all the 10 operational creditors will be the part of financial will be the part of committee of creditors so irp constitutes a committee of creditors if there are two or more financial creditors uh, as a part of consortium that means they have collectively uh, advanced the money then they both are going to be part of uh, COC and their voting will be in proportion to the amount that they have advanced. If a person is financial as well as an operational creditor, then his voting share will be determined accordingly in proportion to his debt as a financial creditor, right? Uh, and if he assigns his debt to a financial creditor, then again the voting will be accordingly proportionate. Now, once the committee of creditors has been constituted, Within seven days, you have to conduct the first meeting. First meeting of COC. Just like we have read about general meetings of shareholders or the board meetings, like that we also have the meetings of the committee of creditors. Wherein a notice has to be sent. A notice has to be sent um, five days notice to every participant. It uh, Five days notice to every participant, it may be reduced by COC to not less than 24 or 48 hours. Forum, forum has to be 33% in value, then voting, all the votes have to be approved by 66% in value. If the quorum is not present, the meeting is going to be adjourned to just the next day, right? If it's a holiday, the succeeding day, right? If the quorum is not present, even in the adjourned meeting, the members present shall constitute the quorum, right? In, in board meeting, if you remember, you um, in general meeting, if you remember, uh, you have read about that the board may decide about the adjournment. Here, nobody decides about the adjournment because everything has to be quick. The process cannot wait, right? Okay. <clears throat> this point I have dealt in later also, so I'm going to tell you later. Now, what happened is, application was filed application was admitted then public announcement oh, sorry moratorium was declared irp was appointed public announcement was made um, claims were collected they were verified they were collated Com uh, committee of creditors was formed by the operation by the financial creditor comprising of the financial creditor or operational creditor whatever the case be after com um, committee of creditors is formed the first meeting takes place within seven days and after that after that in the first meeting of coc rp is appointed resolution professional is appointed that is by 66 percent votes either you appoint the same irp as rp if his consent is obtained or you can also replace IRP if you do that you are going to uh, send this application to adjudicating authority who is going to forward to the board and board confirms within 10 days whether to appoint or not to appoint right so RP is appointed now what does what IRP does what IRP does Okay, IRP has to conduct the whole CIRP process that it, uh, uh, 
IRP has to conduct the whole CIRP process. Whatever documents were available with IRP, IRP is going to hand over the documents to RP. RP also has the same rights and duties and powers as IRP. It has to manage the operations till the IRP ends or the liquidation order is passed. He has to conduct the meetings of COC. In the first meeting, he is appointed. So, subsequent meetings he, of course, conducts in the manner specified by board. And um, he also has certain duties as are given in section number 25. And he also prepares information memorandum. Information memorandum. See, information memorandum contains that relevant information. What happens is we have certain uh, eligible resolution applicants. What is the main motive we are going to conduct? We are conducting CIRP. So we want someone to come up with a beautiful resolution plan how this company can resolve. But unless we have the details we require to formulate a plan, we cannot provide a plan. The information memorandum basically contains the relevant information which uh, is needed, which is needed uh, by every resolution applicant to make a plan which also contains the details about the compliance of law and like things, right. So these are their duties. During CIRP, if at any point of time COC finds that no, we don't want to continue with this RP, they can by 66% votes resolve and uh, propose a new RP, obtain its consent, forward the name to AA. It is going to forward the name to IBBI and IBBI is going to be going to confirm that no disciplinary proceeding is pending. So he shall be appointed. If it is pending, then uh, board recommends a name. Okay, and he shall be appointed. There are certain duties or actions which are subject to approval also under section 28. Certain actions which are subject to approval. But I am not, I uh, will not uh, deal in detail but once you start, the, once you just go over the flow. See, resolution professional undertakes all the duties, it has all the powers, but there are certain things for which it requires the approval of committee of creditors. Just like when we read about a company, the board has powers, but the powers of both section 179, they're also restricted. Certain powers require approval of shareholders, right? So the same happens over here also. Uh, if you want to raise any there are, I don't think I have included that section 28 in the chart. So you, you read it on your own. Anyways, if you want to raise any interim finance, that means already you have so much of loan, now you want more loan. You want to raise some interim finance, you cannot raise it on your own, you need to go and take the permission from committee of creditors, if you want to create any security interest, if you want to uh, delegate any authority, if you want to undertake any related party transactions, right, if you want to uh, make some changes in some contracts. So there are certain things which are given in section number 28 for which you require approval. Otherwise, you have to protect the assets, you have to take control of the assets, you have to exercise right for corporate debtors. You have to file application for avoidance of transactions, chapter 3. You have to maintain an updated list of claims. If you are unable to understand this, I am going to tell you later. Don't worry. You can appoint if any professional you need. You have to represent in third uh, corporate debt and third party dealings and you have to perform other actions as specified by board. So these are all theoretical things. Right. Now, what happens the next important step is that inviting resolution plans you have provided you have prepared information memorandum right and that includes all the details that are needed to formulate a plan so there are certain resolution applicants who are the persons who are not eligible are given under section 29a 
of course uh, it it doesn't have to be someone who is uh, related or someone who is not competent a person who is disqualified to become a director cannot be a resolution applicant someone who has been prohibited that you cannot trade he cannot be a resolution applicant someone who is convicted on offense or someone who is uh, disabled under some foreign law or uh, some connected person or someone who is insolvent right or promoter <clears throat> so all these people are not going to be eligible to be the resolution applicant other than that if you are eligible then you can submit a plan you can prepare you can formulate a resolution plan and you can submit the same the so resolution applicant on the basis of information memorandum they submit a resolution plan plus affidavit of eligibility that yes i'm not disqualified to be a resolution applicant they submit the plan to resolution professional who examines the plan because all the plans has to conform to section number 31 they have to conform to certain standards see uh, the whole dirp process involves a lot of cost maybe you have to spend 5 lakh rupees in this cost paying the fees of rp paying the fees of irp other administrative type of expenses so whatever plan you are formulating that should ensure that these costs are also met it should ensure that you are not contravening any law right now so resolution process cost should be provided how you are going to manage the affairs of the company after this plan is approved how are you going to implement the plan there should be no contravention of law and it should conform to the guidelines of ibba now this point will clear a lot of air ma'am when we were constituting committee of creditors who is going to be involved in all the decision making you said that the operational creditors will not be included unless uh, we have to necessarily include them in the absence of financial creditors otherwise financial creditors will be the part of committee of creditors so supposedly five financial creditors form the part of committee of creditors now a resolution plan is presented before them which says that all their debts will be paid off but the operational creditors will have to make compromises they will immediately sanction the plan they will say yes yes let them compromise and we are going to get our money so wouldn't it be harsh on part of operational creditors and yes why operational creditors are not included in the committee of creditors is because they do not have that adequate sense and knowledge about the finances point number 1 but that doesn't mean that their rights will be compromised so whenever a plan is being made resolution professional at its first place ensures that that plan should provide for their debts first ma'am if all their debts will be provided it will again be very difficult right so their debts have to be provided for uh supposedly i say that okay their debts have to be provided for so maybe the financial creditor will say that okay if we have to pay them 10 crore of rupees let's pay them 1 crore only and the resolution plan conforms to the standard that we have also provided for operational debts you get my point so this is also not going to be work and this might also be harsh on them so 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 what the code says what ibc tells us is that it is mandatory it is necessary that whatever resolution plan is being presented it should provide for the debts of operational creditor at least to that amount that they would get if the company goes into liquidation so today if we wind up the company we sell all the assets and we pay off the liabilities what will they get at least they will get 4 crores so at least 4 crores should be there in that resolution plan so that there should not be any um, uh, injustice to 
operational creditors also so if if all these things exist in the plan then that plan is going to be presented before the committee of creditors they can either approve the plan or they can reject the plan supposedly they approve the plan um, then just a second mm, this does not happen there is adjudicating authority supposedly they approve the plan then it is submitted to then it is submitted to adjudicating authority submitted to adjudicating authority adjudicating authority adjudicating authority might might approve or reject the plan okay it might reject the plan or it might approve the plan if it approves the plan if it approves the plan right now it's now it's good to go so the plan is presented to committee of creditors committee of creditors can approve the plan or they can reject the plan right if they approve the plan the plan is going to be approved by at least uh, 66 percent in value vote so if they approve it then the plan is submitted to adjudicating authority and if they also approve it then the moratorium comes to the end you have to now implement the plan and the plan is going to be applicable to the company to government everyone uh, you cannot say that the plan is not going to be applicable to this person or that person right yes of course you uh, the person who is not satisfied can appeal on certain grounds to the adjudicating authority now if supposedly coc rejects the plan then we don't have a choice it is going to run into liquidation if supposedly coc approves the plan but aa rejects the plan then also it's going to run into liquidation right so we don't have time what can be the other grounds on which uh, liquidation may start if the plan is not submitted within the time limit if the coc resolved that no coc at any point of time found out that it is futile that we are undertaking the cirp process nothing is going to happen it's better that we wind up the company so cirp passed a resolution by 66 percent votes that let's um, uh, liquidate the company so it will go for liquidation if corporate debtor contravenes the plans and someone appeals that they are not following the plan then it will come to an end and the liquidation order will be the will be passed if the mm, resolution plan is rejected as i already told you right rejection of resolution plan that is something that i've already told you so in all these cases the process of liquidation my dear starts the process of liquidation starts so the plan if approved is going to be applicable to the corporate data its employees the members creditors guarantors all the stakeholders and even government or any local authority which is involved the moratorium comes to the end and um, the resolution uh, plan is going to be implemented here I think uh, so far the things are clear if anyone wants to appeal they can appeal if the approved plan was in contravention is in contravention of law or RP has not been regular in his exercise of powers or has misused his powers the operational creditors debts has not been provided for the IRP cost has not been provided for or the plan doesn't comply with any criteria which is mentioned by IBBI. So on these grounds, appeal can be made. Then comes the process of liquidation. 
the process of liquidation see the code the main motive of the code is to resolve that is why it is known as CIRP that is corporate insolvency resolution process however if uh, the attempt to resolve the insolvency of a corporate debtor fails then only the liquidation process is triggered and as soon as the liquidation process is triggered you have to first appoint the liquidator right so far the proceedings were being conducted by the resolution professional now the proceedings will be conducted by the liquidator so who is going to be appointed as the liquidator irp uh, sorry rp rp can be appointed as liquidator also provided he gives the consent if he does not give the consent then someone else will be appointed as liquidator see as soon as the order of liquidation is passed that means now the company is going to be dissolved all the assets will be sold the liabilities will be paid off that means it is a deemed notice to all the employees that you are no more needed it is your termination right so it is a deemed notice of discharge to all the employees etc liquidator is appointed resolution professional will act as liquidator if he gives his written consent and he shall have all the powers of board of director or kmp and personnel uh, that is the employees they have to extend the assistance to liquidator if however the plan was rejected because it could not meet the requirements as given under section 31 then if rp was proved to be incompetent in the CIRP process how can you expect him to be competent in the liquidation process so in that case he will not be appointed if the board recommends that we want some RP to be replaced for reasons in writing then he will not be appointed or if IRP doesn't give his written consent not request but consent so he will not be appointed as he will not be appointed as liquidator okay so in these cases how the liquidator will be appointed adjudicating authority will direct the board to propose a name and within 10 days the board and ibbi proposes a name with his written consent and such person will be appointed as liquidator what is liquidator going to do he's going to verify the claims invite the claims settle the claims uh, he shall take into custody all the assets protect those assets uh, carry on business if needed until when needed sell the property by auction transfer or any other manner he can make negotiable instruments he can take out uh, in official name letter of administration to deceased contributory i have explained this particular point in the class in detail obtain professional assistance if needed he can institute suits just to file to recover money and everything he has to investigate affairs with respect to undervalued and professional transactions which i'm going to tell you right now to take all the actions to sign the documents apply to adjudicating authority for necessary orders or other specified function now liquidator will have the access to all information from information utility books of accounts and everything and if the creditor asks for information from the liquidator then liquidator also has to provide financial information to them within seven days now liquidation estate what do we mean by liquidation estate see there is a company what are the assets will be treated uh, what are the assets which are going to be included in that uh, consortium and what are the assets which will not be included so of course the assets which corporate debtor has ownership rights any encumbered assets also all types of assets whether tangible intangible if there are some decisions there was some suit pending for which court has declared that yes this asset belongs to the company so that asset will also be of the company if there is some asset which has been recovered through proceedings during cirp proceedings that assets also assets which are collateral um, see whenever there is a creditor whenever there is a creditor secured creditor supposedly he has two choices he is a secured creditor he has some asset 
he might enforce his security interest or he might let it go if he enforces his security interest supposedly he has a loan of 10 crores and he has um, a, an asset as a collateral security of say 8 crores so he has two choices he can give this asset back right and uh, or he can enforce that security interest and realize his money in both the cases if company has more money it will be paid supposedly the creditor chooses to sell that asset and realizes money now he will be paid the differential amount of two crores at a very later stage the order of preferential payments that unpaid portion of the secured creditor comes at a later stage but supposedly he lets go of his security interest now he will be paid here all the 10 crore rupees if the company has 100 crore he will definitely get his 10 crores but if he chooses to sell off the security interest he might be uh, get the unpaid portion or he might not get the unpaid portion unrealized portion right so he has a choice to make if he lets go of his security interest then that asset will also be included the proceeds of liquidation of course and all the property that were uh, that belonged to the company at the commencement what will not be included supposedly i have a building which is on lease so it does not belong to corporate debtor it is just in the corporate debtor's possession so it will not be included collateral which is held by the financial service providers that will not be taken as i told you as i gave you the example if it is relinquished then that will be taken personal assets of shareholders assets of indian or foreign subsidiary or other as may be specified by the board so once the liquidation proceedings start within 30 days liquidator will collect all the claims with the supporting documents verify the claims uh, and can admit the claims or maybe reject some claims if you reject then the person has the power to appeal also that why you have rejected their claim one person has submitted the claim they can uh, change their claim within 14 days of submission or they can withdraw also now after the liquidator has collected all the claims it is going to check for preferential transactions undervalued transactions extortionate credit transactions and apply to adjudicating authority accordingly after that liquidator will sell off the assets and pay off the claims in what order you have to distribute the assets or pay off the claims first of all you will provide for the cost and secondly you will provide for these two things debts of secured creditor if they have relinquished uh, their security interest of course as well as the workman's dues for past two years 24 months okay so if if the money is not sufficient to cover both they will be paid proportionately the third step uh, the third stage is wages other than workmen for past 12 months then financial debts to unsecured creditor see the unpaid portion if you if a secured creditor enforces a security interest then the unpaid portion comes even after the unsecured creditor so it's sometimes better to let go of the security interest so you will be paid here otherwise you will get the unpaid portion at a later stage so it depends what amount of asset you have as collateral if it is sufficient to cover your dues then you should enforce your security interest otherwise you should let it go right so amount due to central government state government and this remaining debts and dues then preference shareholders and at the last equity shareholders as well as the partners so liquidator is going to distribute the proceeds when all the assets are liquidated liquidator is going to make an application to adjudicating authority for dissolution for dissolution right um, so i hope uh, so far the things are clear we have some preferential transactions preferential transactions may be the Govern, uh, the management had some idea that the company might run into liquidation so they repaid certain amount to a related party or to a non-related party when the company was not in a very good position so that transaction looks like a preferential transaction so the money will be taken back from them right 
uh, RP is going to apply, uh, liquidator is going to apply to adjudicating authority and uh, those deemed preferences will be reversed. The order will be passed accordingly. Likewise, you also have undervalued transactions and uh, extortionate credit transactions. I think uh, so far you must have understood the whole process. The amendments in IBC as well as a very important portion of PPIRP that is pre-packaged insolvency resolution process is there in any other video. Please check that out. Very important for examination point of view. You can expect certain questions from them. So you check out that it is in the other video. You can of course increase the speed of the videos and watch it at your own pace. I don't teach too fast or too slow just to maintain that pace. Uh, of course, I understand that your exams are approaching, so you don't want any time to be wasted. But at the same time, you can increase the speed. I cannot be too fast for I have a lot of students to match up to. Now, apart from that, you also have fast track insolvency resolution process. And uh, you also have voluntary liquidation, very small topics. I think you can just read them, just two pages and uh, do it on your own. That's it, my dear. I'm winding up the IBC session here itself. Hope you would gain that understanding and of course, uh, make full use of these charts. You can incorporate other points on your own to make this chart a more comprehensive one. Thank you and all the best.